like the curtains. All right. Praise the Lord. It does have, does give it a different look. Amen. All right. Okay. We want to make sure. Okay, good, good. All right. All right, testing, testing. One, two, three. Okay. All right, everybody. We want to welcome you to the Sunday Law Update, updating you on where we are in Bible prophecy as they are happening every single day in the books of Daniel and Revelation. We have a triple header today. Uh, before we get into our update, we have our faithful State line young people, say hi to everybody. Amen. Amen. We have some parents here. We're going to be doing our country living segment, and we're going to talk about Agagra and how our young people, along with their parents, went to this event in Florida. And Brother Abraham will be leading out in that, and brothers and sisters. And then Dr. Thomas Jackson is going to come at, um, come at 435 to give us an hour-long presentation, and then we'll give you a prophetic update on what's going on. We will want to let you know that a Christian, have, have you heard of Christian nationalism? Yes. Well, we have a video to show you where a Christian nationalist is calling. Sister Mason, you, know, you, want, you want me to tell you what it's about? Christian nationalist calls for a rest day by law. Brothers and sisters, this thing is almost over. And we thank God for the truth as it is in Jesus. So we want to just welcome you, and we want to ask that you will spread this all around social media because, brothers and sisters, it's going to be hot today. So before we get into anything else, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Bless us, Lord God, as the crew here will be speaking. In Jesus' name, amen. And what we're going to do is, is that we're going to hand it over to Brother Abraham, and then what we will do is, is that we will hand it over to Dr. Jackson, who's going to give us a talk from the Word. Amen, amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Well, before we get started, I'd just like, I guess, at least the parents on the panel to just introduce themselves, and uh, I guess we'll just go from there with along with your, uh, your, your children. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Toussaint Henry, and I'm here with my son. Isaiah. Hi, my name is Sandra. Amen. Of, co of course, I'm Abraham and uh, Ella Deontay. Right. Yes. Um, Elder Jefferson, and uh, this is two of my sons. Michael Jefferson. Josiah Jefferson. Yes. Amen. Amen. So we went to at Agra earlier this year in January. I believe it was the second week in January uh, when it was snowed in, in the north. But we were in Florida, right. so we enjoyed the weather. Right. And when we went to uh, at Agra, there are certain things that we we liked, we enjoyed. But there's also a portion of an agra that um, addresses the needs of the kids, the education of the kids, as far as country living and things that they need to learn in order to uh, progress in the, the uh, uh, country living mindset, the family home. And we'll just like to talk about it and talk about the kids, talk to the kids about what they learned, um, how they enjoyed it, um, how, they felt about, how they felt about it. And um, just to let you know that this was not just something for adults, but it dealt with the whole family. Amen? And so that's what our mindset should be as uh, the family of God when we have events. It's not just for the adults. We have children. And so we need to address the needs of the children also. Um, you can see on the screen there that, you know, the, at Agra, and the, the next event that's coming up in uh, next year in Texas is growing better, bringing God's plan for agriculture into each life through in-person experience. And so you see that there's a spiritual side of the program. It's not just saying go out there and learn how to uh, garden or so forth. It's how do you take that and then try to reach someone for Christ. Amen. Now, the next slide that I have is a slide of the place that we stayed. We were able to get a cabin, 
and uh, it was very good. How did you guys feel about it? I liked it. It was good. <laughs> Micah, how did you like the cabin? It was good. Yeah. Joe, how did you like the cabin? It's good. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. And it was also spacious, so I like that. And I got to sleep on a bunk bed for once. Amen, amen. And so, uh, yeah, we had fun. Uh, what, what did we have to do each morning when we got up? Go to, uh, go to class, all right? Oh, yeah, we had to, uh, we, we uh, did, like, devotion, and then we went to class, yeah. Amen, amen. So uh, this, this next picture is just a highlight. It's, it's a crowd that's there. That's, that's the main meeting area. Um, just for time's sake, uh, the next slide is going to be something that the kids did. Uh, do you guys recognize what's on the screen? Yes. It was yeah. a Dutch oven cooking class, and me and my group, we made pizza. It was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys heard about the Dutch? Anyone know about the Dutch cooking class? Dutch cooking? It's really, it's primitive, but it's very, uh, what, what did you guys eat from the Dutch oven? What, what, what was made? I don't think they had any. Oh, they didn't get a yeah. chance? Oh. I don't think so. Okay, you remember? You excited? So we older kids from 10 to 14 made yeah. pizza, and 5 to 9 made all the dessert. What desserts were made? Cobbler, pie, etc. Okay, <laughs> do you remember anything, Isaiah? Yes, um, some people made pizza, as Sandra said, the 10 to 14, we made pizza, then some other people made chili with beans and ground crum cr crumbles, and some uh, people also made soup. Okay, so what, what was the process? What, what had to be done? Um, there was a list, there was a list of uh, what you would say, uh, ingredients on the table, and then the teacher would assign you um, a meal to make, and he would give you the paper, then you had to go run to the table, and uh, yeah, you try to, well, some people were competing, different teams were competing, but you didn't have to, but yeah, there was ingredients on the table, and then you would have to make it with your team. Okay, amen. So, um, the, the pick is kind of self-explanatory. What you're doing is, well, can you guys explain to me exactly what you had to do with the, the Dutch oven? Why is it called a Dutch oven? Um, the, I can't remember why it's called a Dutch oven, but the process was basically you make your food, you put it in there, then you go to the area where we had all of these coals, and we put the coals under the pots and on top of them. And both the adults did that part, but that's how we cooked it. And it took forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, because it's like an oven and the coals is like the heat. And per dish, there's a certain amount of coals you have to put because of how hot it has to be. Like pizza needs a lot of coals because it's baking it. So yeah, that's why it's called a, like a Dutch oven. Amen, amen. Um, what, what class exactly did? Uh, they were in um, what was it, the bees, I think, when the they made the, um, one of them was the bees and then there was the rescue dog. Yes. And um, and then I think they just swapped it. First it was the older with the dogs, and then the younger with the bees. Then it was the younger with the dogs, and then Amen. older with the bees. Amen. So they just swapped the two. So with that, you're seeing that the program is designed is is trying to take care of the needs of being on the homestead, right? Right. The the country home, and um, well, let me just show you this video before we go, go, get to that. This, this was the meal that was prepared in the Dutch oven. It looked good, too. Right? So it was actually, they, they made, uh, was there salsa? Salsa? There, was, there was a... No, they made, that, they made yeah. something else on that last day. Yes. That, that's what that was. No, it was a wrap, I think it was. Essentially, when we go camping, one of the things that we normally do is we cook on, like, 
just, we, you know, you make a campfire with sticks and, and things of that. But what the Dutch oven is, is showing us is that, you know, we're having a time where you can't buy or sell, right? We won't have access to certain things. And so with that in mind, the children are being taught how to start a fire, how to have um, that speci spe um, special pot, the Dutch pot, in which you can cook with the coals on top and prepare a full meal, right? And so it's, it's teaching you primitive living, but it's educating you on how your food, where your food actually comes from, and how to put it together. Amen? Amen? Anything you'd like to say? I like the fact that the, the whole experience was geared towards family. Yeah. And I know for me, some of the best presentations was with the couples uh, or the family presenting. So right. it was a very family atmosphere. Yep. Um, there were activities too. Isaiah was able to meet a lot of friends. Do you want to tell them about some of the activities that you um, were a part of? Uh, I just, um, so in between classes, there was like sometimes a break and then I'll play football or soccer with these good group of people <laughs> and stuff like that, like, yeah. Because like some classes were separated into yeah. different times, but yeah, I would like, and sometimes I would play basketball or something like that. But yeah, yeah. So I thought that that was very very good. There was lots of interactions there, um, and you know what? It was actually a international event. Yep. It was an international event. You had people coming from from different countries, so it was just not individuals from the United States. From where? Um, one kid was in my class, one was from Scotland, and the other was from Australia. So that was great to just share different cultures, you know, and just get to learn and to see worldwide Christianity and, and oneness. Amen. And I, Amen. Yeah, well, I would like to add as well, like, um, with the younger kids, what I, what I enjoyed about the classes, like Elder Abraham said, the whole the whole program is family oriented not only were the presenters but also they they had things for adults and they had things for children and it and it, it was really nice and even in the children's class they would do things like uh they would do a short lecture but then they would do a craft or something to just reinforce whatever that lecture was and the kids really enjoyed it and they always were able to leave with something a painting or some kind of craft that was a uh, object lesson of whatever they learn so amen do you guys remember doing the the the, the activity with the jar with the beans oh, yeah. uh what did you guys think about that did you guys do that one with the beans yeah they did I, yeah do you remember that you want to talk about it got that class did you remember making it yeah <laughs> did you enjoy it mm -hmm. what did you have to do put some different beans inside the jars the mason jars yeah Joe, did you do that? Did you make the beans? Yes. What did you do? I put the different kinds of beans. Okay. And then you put it in a jar. And what was it? To, uh, I think it was different sizes or something. Did you have fun doing that? Yes. Did you make some friends? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, um, the beans, I actually still have them. I haven't eaten them yet. <laughs> so the full what we well, all we had to do was we grabbed a mason jar and we put beans in whatever pattern we wanted inside the jar. Then we cut a piece of cloth that was already um it was there was a circle drawn on it and we cut that out and we put that on and then we screwed the mason jar lid closed. So then we had like a cloth cap, and it was really cool. Uh, what about the microgreen classes that you, uh, I remember you and Isaiah doing the microgreens. How did that turn out? How did you? <laughs> um, we, so as I think it was, 
Dante, he said they will give us a lecture. So the lecture was, well, yeah, a lecture. It was about the microgreens, and then we did a craft. And the craft was you can do a design and uh, to put uh, how you want to put your microgreens. And for me, I put an eye for Isaiah. So I first we got a pen and we got some bounty um, paper towel, and then we folded it in half. And then you write the design you want. Then you have to come with some Elmer's liquid glue, and then you um, draw or trace over the, um, the, the letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the the letter. And then you put. They will give you some microgreen seeds, and then you will put it down. And then eventually, when we got home, we would put them in some water, and then they eventually sprouted. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Was it was it a difficult process? Do you think it was difficult or? Oh uh, no, it was a fairly simple process. <laughs> Okay. Yes, um, unfortunately, mine's died. <laughs> All right. So, so to to actually start um, doing some kind of gardening, do you think it's something that anyone can really start doing? Yes. 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 Right. Even at a small scale, if it. Even that you can still yes, do. because many of us are afraid to start, and we see like even from the, the basic things, we can teach the children how to start, what to do, how they can go about certain things, and yes. uh, you know how to approach agriculture. Yes, I just want to add to what Elder Abraham is saying. I know because we have a garden, and uh, but this year, God, by God's grace, I'm gonna make some small little plots. So these guys, I have three sons, my other son is with my wife over there. And uh, these guys are going to be doing a little something this year because they, they really enjoyed it. And I don't think they did the microgreens. They did, um, the younger ones did, a, um, it was like different vegetables. And they cut it up, like let's say like a pepper or, or a cucumber. And I remember some other things. And then they would dip it in paint and just stamp it. Uh, you remember that, Mike? You remember, you want to tell us about it? Yes, son. Okay, Joe, you remember that? It was fun? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so they just did paintings with um, different... There was also corn. There was corn, and what else? Yeah, you just rolled on there. And then it looks like tire tracks. Right, right. And what else was it? There was, was the There was mushrooms. And there was mushrooms? And there was broccoli, too. And broccoli. And they were painted and then make stamps on the um uh, on the paper now i missed the lecture because we was in adult class so i'm not sure what the lecture was that they covered so one of the things that i liked is that as you can see on the screen what the children were taught they had a very practical application yeah. to it <laughs> so so they were able to eat the food afterwards the microgreens, um, Isaiah brought them home, and we were able to partake of that. Um, the bees class, it was, it was very applicable, um, teaching them how to work with the dog, deal with the dog. We have a dog. We have a farm. So everything was actually applicable for country living. Amen, amen. Uh, no, our time is running. I'll just show you one more slide. See, with Ag um, at Agra, this is also a curriculum that they have for different age group. For the children. Amen. You want to? Uh, yeah, yeah. I just want to add, uh, going back to what I had just said, they have uh, a curriculum set because I have bought the whole set from pre K all the way up to high school. And, and what it does is shows them, it, it lays out lessons that you can teach your children, spiritual lessons in the garden. So you're teaching them how to garden and spiritual lessons in the garden at the same time. And it has um, the curriculum from PK all the way up to high school. So I bought the whole curriculum, not only for our children, but that we could also use it for the church's children. So yeah, we, we, had, we already purchased the, the whole set for us, literally, and also to use with the children at the church. Amen. So you see the whole program is designed not just for to be uh, successful as a farmer, right. but how the whole family can actually work together. It deals with true education what, um, as a people, we should be teaching. Remember, when we look at Israel, they were an agrarian society. Right. You know, and, you know, there's this one statement in Ministry of Feeling where it talks about every family should have a home with land associated right. with it. And no devising of man could, ex could can improve 
upon the plan that God has in store f- uh, for, for those of us that will take hold of that program. Amen. And so it's just, this is just hopefully to encourage um, all of us to keep moving in that, that direction to want to do what God has asked us to do and to be obedient and receive the blessings of God as a result. Amen. Amen. Any closing thoughts? Micah, would you go again? Mm-hmm. Would you go again, Josiah? Yep. yep. How about you, Simon? Would you go again? I would go for the rest of my life. Amen. Uh, How about you, Isaiah? Yeah, I would go again, yes. What about the zoo? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They actually had a zoo on campus. Oh. Yeah, so the, the church on our, because uh, it's an Adventist campground. It's a church zoo. It's a church zoo. So it is a zoo on the campus where they held the um, the camp meeting. So yeah, it, and it's lions, tigers. They were amazing. Yeah, like real thing, mountain yeah. lions. So it's not just little frogs and stuff. It's the real deal. Yeah. There was a skunk. There. Skunk. We actually yep. got to pet the skunk. skunk yeah. right. What? Yes. We, no, you don't no, want to pet the no, lion. No, not the lion. We could hear them roaring it's two at of them. cabin. It's called Judah and uh, Faith, I think. Faith, it, yeah. Judah the, what was the, I know I, the I male was Judah. Judah is the male, yes. And I think it was Faith was the, yeah, the every, female Every line. morning you heard, you heard the oh, roar. Oh, yeah, definitely. Every mm-hmm. morning. Yeah, but it was fun. Um, yeah, when we went there on Sabbath and uh, toured and see the different animals and uh, some birds too, the owls. Yeah, they have birds. Uh, yep. Some monkeys. Uh, different yeah. things, and there so was that was the nature. That was the yeah. nature walk on a Sabbath. Snakes, yeah. Snakes. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Now they have cheetahs, <laughs> but they, um, they have some monkeys. Also, you can go on YouTube and pull up Ad Agra. They do have presentations on there. They also have sermons on there. Um, it's a wealth of knowledge, and it is an organization that seems to be growing. I encourage everyone, make plans uh, um, for the next one that's coming up. Uh, it, is, it is helpful for if you, if you are an individual that is a professional farmer, if that is your occupation, they also have advanced classes. Yeah. It, it, it is for everyone. Yeah. If you just want to know how to do basic home garden, to if you have your own business, you can also benefit from there. So it's very um, diversified as far as the training and the information that's provided, along with most of all, the spiritual content. Right. Every, every evening, there was a Vesper thought. There were sermons. You know, this wasn't a convention that we just went and we just talked amongst ourselves, but Jason. at all times, we were pointed upward to Christ. Right. And, and so uh, make plans for the next one. If I can add real quickly, uh, and uh, Elder Henry hit on something important because it had a lot of things for the children, but it also has some very important information for adults. And like he said, they, they had everything for every level. If you had a full-fledged farm, to if you're just doing backyard gardening, or if you just want to get into herbs, or even have solar, right? Uh, putting solar together. They had things where you can fix, um, if you want to learn how to fix small engines, uh, build different things. They had all kind of things that you can do from A to Z, and it was all in line with, with God's plan. So, um, so yeah, it, it, was pretty much diversified. it was very diversified. They had everything you could think of from, for adults and children. Yep. It's going to be in January sometime. January, uh, next year, January. I don't have the dates. You can, you can actually type in at Agra. Right. It's going to be in Texas. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, be in Texas. It yeah. It's going to be in Texas, and so next year, January. But you can just go on the web. Uh, can't recall offhand. I can't remember. You know? You had something you wanted to say? Mm-hmm. I forgot to mention, at Adagra, um, they had a little gathering where we youth who played a musical instrument, we could right. play, we could and play. I was able that to too. play my cello. Yep. Amen. And it was, um, Dr. Jackson? At? Keep talking. Keep talking. It was a um, really good experience. And it, it was fun. Amen. Oh, oh. Somebody had another question? I think it was like five days, I think. Oh, the skunk, they... It was they, Tuesday they, they rem- Sunday, I think. It was. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's it for this evening. Um, just want to thank everyone that was 
able to share what they did, what they found that was enjoyable, um, what God has in store for us, we need to move in that direction. Amen? Amen. Um, make, a, make, um, make ourselves available to learn. There are times when we say we want to do this, I want to learn that, I wish this, and I, you know, but we don't make ourselves available. Amen. And so we, we need to do that. Um, what we plan to do also, uh, going from, from this, is you see what's in the back. We need to revamp that. We need Amen. to um, reorganize and get things together. Um, within the next couple of weeks, we're going to start doing some, probably some educational classes because of all the rain that we're experiencing. And then we're going to be in the back planting and learning what to do, how to do it, testing the soil, doing what we need to do. And once we have that education, then we can go wherever. Wherever you have your land, then you can go there and have a, a plot. And once you understand what the, uh, a certain area can produce, you know what you can do for your family. Right. If we understand no buy, no sell, that right. is across the board. Yes. Right. And so if we're given the message, just like Noah, that hammer needs to be hitting the, hitting the heart. That's the right. nail needs to be going in. And that's equivalent to us working in the garden and other things that will enable us to be self-sufficient, self-sustaining. And so when God sends people our way to our uh, outposts, we can say there is food and we can send you back into the cities to preach. So, Amen? So Amen. Brother Hunnigan, so, you know, just from a practical standpoint, um, how much, I mean, even if a person does not have, a, like, an acres of land, how can you, what tips could you give for people just to get started somewhere? Just uh, start with uh, containers. You can start container gardening. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, if, um, when, I remember when I was in Huntsville in the apartment, we were on the second floor. We were, we had a, a balcony. We were, we were growing stuff in containers. Amen. And then when you get, go further, start with small raised beds. If you have a yard, then you can dedicate a certain part of your yard to a garden and do different things. In the book, Ministry of Healing, Ellen White has a chapter called Help for the Homeless. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how every Jewish family, as you already know, had a garden and that a plot of land with fertility. And she says that no other plan that man has ever devised has outdid what God has ever ordained, improved ever improved, thank you, upon that plan. ever yes. improved, and why? Can you tell us why, and what are the financial benefits of us growing our own food? Um, the, the, the plan of God is to be self-sustaining, um, not to be held in check by man. Right. And so if God needs you to do something, then you can go and do it, right? You look at the economy of uh, Israel, it was within Israel, can you give that to him? right? Everyone was yeah. sustained by in Israel. And so even Paul, he said he was a tent maker. So there were different practical things that was given for each individual. But to have, um, oh, okay. there's a reason also why, why God said that even if you sold your land, it had to go back to you at mm. the Jubilee, right? After, um, seven, After seven, seven, seven years. years, right. What is that, Jubilee? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so there was a purpose why God even had that. And that was designed to take care of poverty. Right. Right? So if we're experiencing poverty in our world, then we're understanding that we're on a world system. We're dealing with the world economy. But we get on God's program, then God will address the issue of poverty. Right. Even though he says the poor that you have always with you, that has to deal with man's selfishness spiritually. Amen? Yeah. But the purpose of land is to deal with poverty and how to address the needs of community. Right? Because to grow means that you're willing to share, to border, and it, it has something to do more so with community, with family. So gardening is not for selfish gain. And you're going to find that when you grow, even a small area, you're going to have so much that you have to share it. You know? Amen. Well, praise the name of the Lord. Amen. So young people, you may, you are dismissed. Amen. Can we put just two chairs right here, please? Amen. Brothers and sisters, now, um, the spirit of prophecy says, now, the second work that's going to be done, we want to thank God for this, because um, we know that agriculture is the ABCs of education. Amen? All right, we were told that. Amen. That agriculture is the A, B, and Cs of education. 
And there's practical reasons for this. Now, there's another work Ellen White says will be one of the last works, which will be the literature evangelistic work. Now, also, in addition to that, we are told in Councils on Health that soon there will be no work done in ministerial lines. But what kind of work, somebody? Medical missionary work. Now, Pastor Jackson, where, two, yes. Where's the statement at where she says that um, those who would find a labor, do this work, will find a field of labor anywhere? Where's that found at? What page? Desire. No, it's not Desire of Ages. Huh? It's not Desire of Ages. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, Councils on Health, page 506. All right, yes. She says, quote, as religious aggression subverts the liberties of our nation. Now, understand this. After Dr. Jackson shows you this presentation, we're going to show you how the Christian nationalists are ready right now to do a takeover of the government come election day. And it says here, those who will stand for freedom of conscience will be placed in unfavorable positions. Then she says, for their own sake, for whose sake? For their own sake, while they have opportunity, they should become intelligent in regard to disease. Number one is what? Number two is causes. Number two is what, somebody? Number three is prevention. What did I say? And last but not least, what people are coming to the medical missionary for is cure. She says, those who do this, will find a field of labor anywhere. Do you understand this? If you want to find a job, you want to create a job, become a medical missionary. And after nearly 30 years of being a minister, I have um, embraced this thing. And by the grace of God, I, had to, I didn't get a chance to go to meet ministries to learn under Dr. Jackson. But I want to tell you, Sister Jackson, I read his book on cancer, and it really started teaching me. And from that time, God has been teaching me. And so I decided to take a course. And by the grace of God, I'm going to get my naturopathic doctor degree this year in original medicine, brothers and sisters. And so we going forward, Brother Larry and myself, we are teaming up together with other medical missionaries to um, do health coaching. And we're going to be having, I mean, two weeks, a... Um, a group session, a, 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 a group session where we can, on Zoom where we're going to invite Dr. Jackson and others so we can talk about getting healed. Amen. So we're trying to embrace this. Ellen White says that ministers will not be ministers after the gospel order until we take a decided interest in healing the sick. Amen. How many medical missionaries we got in the house? Oh, oh I, I, I'll go. Dude, it's the God is the healer. Amen. Exactly. I like that because let me ask you a question. Whenever a person is sick, what do we do when it comes to, what well, are you supposed to do? Pray, but hold on now. Somebody says, what herb do I use? I, I, have you heard that? That's the first. Go ahead. If we're giving them advice on what herbs, but what happens is we got to point them to the great healer. Am I right? And let them know that disease is the cause. But the cause of disease is what? Sin. Am I right? And we're supposed to educate them. Amen. What did Alan G. White say? The cause must be ascertained. And then she says, number two, unhealthful conditions shall be changed. Wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted. Do you understand this? So, brothers, this, then is at the end, not at the beginning. So, understand who's the great healer? God. So right now, we're going to turn over to Dr. Thomas Jackson. Um, it's Brother Jackson. I, I saw him. All right. He, he has his computer up. So what we're going to do is, is that Dr. Jackson is going to spend about an hour or so on this topic. And then we're going to just show you how religious subversion is getting ready to happen in our country. This could be the year. Do you understand this? I didn't say this will be the year. It could be the year. Any which way, we need to become intelligent in regard to medical missionary. How many medical missionaries we got in the house? Then heal the sick. <laughs> well, Jesus did tell us to heal. Jesus did say to heal the sick, right? Well, we, Jesus, okay, I know, I, I know, I, we can't heal anybody, but He gives us power to do it, right? <laughs> okay, anyway, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna argue with the medical missionary. Right, exactly. It's God is the healer. Amen. All right. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead.
<laughs> but but she's my spiritual mother too, right? <laughs> hey, man, go ahead, my brother. Does anybody remember anything we talked about this morning? Name me three things. Quickly, quickly now. God's grace is not his approval. Mm. I have what? For, oh, your career is not your purpose. Your, call, your career is what you pay for. Your calling is what you made for. Trials are quizzes. That's right. Donald. This is the one. Look at her. Look at him. Look at him. Come here, Donald. Come here. Come here. No, she know what I'm talking about. Come here, come here Donald. We're going to help her mental capacity right now. Come. Come on, come here. <laughs> this, this precious soul because we get mistaken now as long as he's sitting down they might think he's my brother look at him don't go, don't go nowhere so we're sitting there at lunch and she was fixing Dr. Jackson meal What's no problem she took it to him now look and that's not a problem she, she took my meal to him thinking that he was the speaker because we look alike and I'm not disappointed in her. I'm not, I'm not disappointed in her. My person. <laughs> the man did not say nothing. <laughs> I was waiting on the dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't blame you, sister. He should have been the one that said, no, I'm not him. Does that make sense? He didn't do that. He didn't do that. <laughs> Biblical laws of the mind, the foundation for healing and restoration. We have clearly understood in sanitary work, health center work, that the number one approach to healing is right here. You know, you can have, we can have good skills, hydrotherapy, herbology, all that we have, good tools. But if you don't know how to address that broken mind. You know, we had an individual um, couple, but this one in particular was very, keep in my memory, fourth stage prostate cancer, fourth stage. He, he lost his wife through death a couple of years, a few years, then he remarried, okay? So when he came to the center, he was not, he was not an Adventist. It doesn't make a difference. And so when we come there, they go through the mechanical routine. Then I have the privilege to consult with every health guest, every health guest. Because in the sessions, 
they're getting, you know, praise, blessings from God. But when you sit down and talk to folks, how to address the brokenness, the brokenness. So in 10 days into the session, he gave his testimony. And he said this, you can pick his testimony on YouTube. He said, I thank God for cancer. What y'all think about that, Q? You ever heard somebody say, I thank God for cancer? Ooh. What you think about that? You know, that, huh? It is. He came to the place that he was broken. Number one, he was angry at God of his wife. Resentment, bitterness, all of this was eaten away like termites. Termite. And not until he released it to God. Releasing it, struggling. He began to heal, Sister Mason. Hmm? All the herbs, all the juicing. But not until this was addressed. It's very imperative to understand the power of the mind. So let's talk about it a little bit. We're talking about being sealed, amen? amen? What will be the mental condition of God's sealed people? A mental condition. You remember, I put up last in the morning, legalism is a byproduct of not having a clear, correct understanding of God that we try to earn God's favor. We do it because we got to do it, not because we want to do it by God's grace. Very important. So we see then, seal in the forehead. And we know that seal in the forehead, the name of God, you find in the book of Exodus, is talking about the character of God. So the fact is that here in the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe is where God wants to sit on his throne. When you study human anatomy, etc., you have a bone called the, the, the spinard bone. It's like Turkish shadow, shaped like angel wing. And right in the frontal lobe, you have what you call the Christa galley, Christ's room. Christ's room is right here. That spinard bone is served as a cranium to hold that. It's like the covering cherubim over the most holy place. That's where Christ wants to sit, right here. And you know, the devil wants to take the place and assume that role. And so we find then that, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their forehead. That means that only way we're going to see Jesus' face is that we have the same face he has. Who you didn't get what I just said. Because fire can't burn fire. Are you with me? We find here, we talk about that high calling this morning. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but godliness is very important. Christ, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, 23, and 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it come the abundance of life. Very important to understand that. In the book of Genesis, God, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Three components we see there. We find here the living soul, that's the mental, the breath of life, that's the spiritual, dust, that's the physical. Therefore, man is made of three qualities. And at the base of the physical are the five senses, the avenue through which the mind. Accepts. So therefore, you got to understand this. It says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, that's mental. With all thy soul, that's spiritual. With all thy might, that is physical. True health is physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. You cannot separate either one. I know when I was probably, I don't know, young guy. Like I said, I was born in Alabama, grew up in Chicago. But I remember my folks used to raise chickens. Anybody been on a chicken farm? I'm not talking about the kind that Tyson got today. I'm talking about the kind that you run around the pen and grab that chicken. You know what I'm talking about? So they grab that chicken and wring the chicken neck. Hmm, pop. Then they take the chicken to the chopping block. Then they come down with an ax. Then as a young man, I'm watching all of this, the chicken neck fall on the ground, and the body, the body is what? Still alive for a moment. So growing up in Chicago, acting crazy, mom said, boy, 
What did he say? No, he ain't saying read nothing. No, you what? You run around here like your chicken with your neck cut off. Do y'all get that? Oh, I forgot. Y'all not in my generation. I'm too old for you. Come on, give me a witness so I don't feel too old in here. Okay, okay. <laughs> so that means you're not using your head. Are you following what I'm saying? You're not using your head. So the devil, the devil wants this place right here. That's what he's battling for. That's the seat right here. So we move on and find out that Jesus said in Matthew 9, 12, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. In John 5, 6, wilt thou be made whole? Now, in Matthew 9, Christ's method of healing is depicted in this verse. You remember there was a man sick of the palsy. His friend brought him to Christ, but you remember they were, they were authorized. This is what I'm saying. This is the first place, first situation you find authorized preacher break in. Authorized break in. When they tore the towels off the roof. Now, I'm not going to give you unconverted Christians that statement so you can ice Jesus the scripture, think I can go break in. <laughs> Unauthorized break in. So they let him down. The first thing Jesus said, son, be of good cheer or good courage. That's mental. Then he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. That's spiritual. Then he said, take up that bed and walk. Right, that's physical. Christ's method of healing addressed the whole person. You cannot just get supplement, et cetera, et cetera. You got to get the whole package. Am I making sense to you, gospel medical missionary? It's very important to understand that the whole package. So therefore, health is wholeness, not H-O-L, wholeness. Mental, physical, and spiritual. God's plan. Who's familiar with that book, Minister Hill? Anybody? Who, who do not have that book? Raise your hand. Digital copy, huh? Mm -hmm. You have a digital Bible? Mm -hmm. Need to talk to you. This is the cross section of the brain that you were talking about. That's right. Like the angel of God sitting there. Come on, brother. Yes. I like people like you. <laughs> Hold me to it. That's right. This is, as if you can see, what he was talking about earlier was the cross section of the brain. There we see the presence of God sitting with the, the wings of the angel and he's guarding the avenue to the soul. The cross. The cross. The cross section. Yes. Yeah. You got the spin out bone, spin out, S P H E N, yes, yeah, spin out. And I have pictures of that myself. That's good, my brother. What's your name, sir? Vernon Barnett. What do you do, man? I work at Oakwood University as hmm? a physical plant worker. Okay, man. You, you, uh, wait, wait, wait. You're looking for a calling. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't hear me. <laughs> Praise God. That's why I need to come to the calling. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. So, so the people didn't believe me in here, man. God, I've got a witness. Very good. Ministry healing. That book was put in my hand 46 years ago. Didn't know who wrote it, but I read it. Beautiful, uh, beautiful book. It has a section in there called Mind Cure. Yes. Of course, you read. Helping de 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 Daily Living. This is what it says. It was his... Christ's mission to bring to men complete restoration. A, a preacher? You need, do you need to sit in here, man, so you can get some mind cure? That's my son in the Lord. So you got to learn how to separate the behavior from the person. I'm serious. I'm serious. See, God loves everybody. <laughs> but he might not like the behavior. You get what I'm saying? It's important. That's part of the whole ministry. Because we package the behavior with the person and we throw the baby out with the, the bath water. All right, let's move on. Christ's mission to bring complete restoration. He came to give them what? Health and peace and perfection of character. Health, physical. Peace, mental. Character, spiritual. Completeness. All right? Therefore, now, in the book, Ministry of Healing, 
It says the relation that exists between the mind and the body is very intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. Have any of you ever got a knife and hit your big toe? Ooh, that's what your brain said. Brain said mouth, said ouch. Brain said mouth, grab toe. Are you following? It does. You know, that's what it says. As an intimate, maybe over-exaggeration, but that is true. There's a relationship. Now listen to what it says. Thank you, my brother. It says, the condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. Many of the diseases from which men suffer are the results of mental depression. We find grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death. Are you getting this? Yeah. Important. Very important. Therefore, I took the liberty to define these different attributes. Grief, emotional suffering caused by disaster and unfortunate outcome. Tornado come through this place, tear down the church, nobody hurt, come through this place, kill everybody in here. That's what you call emotional suffering caused by disaster. What about anxiety? Anxiety, apprehensive, uneasy of mind, worrying. Worry kills a hundred people where work only kills one. Anxiety. I'm told in inspiration said Christian with anxious heart. Christian with anxious heart. They have not made a complete surrender to God. They fear the consequences of such surrender will entail. Such surrender. Think about that as you're seeking to make decisions. Because when we surrender to God, He's going to leave, but we fear because our mindset has been conditioned to our experience. Then, one of my favorite ones, discontent. You know, I think of uh, Marcus Mason, and especially Sister Mason's husband. He's the only one I can look up to besides Jesus Christ. What, most about 6'9". I remember the last time we... <laughs> Y'all a little slow. <laughs> You know, the, the last camp, yeah, six nine, yeah. and I remember at that camp meeting, the last time I saw Mason, we were standing out there together, you know, and I had to do this, you know, I kind of stepped back a little bit. I'm not like you folks, come on to me and say, man, come on. <laughs> but you see, discontent. Now, I'm not proportionate. I have over four feet of leg. My wife is only 5'4". Are you following me? And my trunk. So I'm not symmetric. You know, I'm not proportional. So this right here, discontent. We know discontent, preacher, got the devil kicked out of hell. I'm very mindful of that. But I have a lot to be discontent. And I don't know what Elder Mason is, but I travel a lot. I fly a lot. And, you know, I'm just an unprofitable servant. So if the people cannot fly me first class or business class, I have to have economy extra aisle seat with leg room. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, if I'm flying to New Zealand, which is 15 hours from California, nonstop, if I'm, if I'm in a, with five rows and I'm sitting in that seat, you got five people, you know, you don't want to step over these folks, you know. You sitting there 15 hours, when the plane leaves, they're going to pick up my trunk and they're going to leave my legs on the floor. I'm serious. I got to have leg room. But that's not it. Discontent. When I go to Thailand, my family over there is only 5'3". They Joe Jam is only 6 feet. They Joe Jam had concrete. Now, when you have a lovely bride from your side, I'm glad she's a missionary, but she don't know how to travel internationally packing. You don't need 10 pairs of shoes in Thailand. You don't need change of raiment in Thailand. Have y'all been, been to a foreign country? You been to Africa, a third world country? You been to? Do, do y'all know how to pack to go to those countries? You what? See, I know you. But anyway, this is true. So I got to carry. My, first, I had to carry her two suitcases. 
And I'm walking because, you know, it was heavy. When I get to the door, I'm serious. This is here, Terry. I lift up, I knock myself out. <laughs> Literally, I knock myself out. Take my little friends to drag this body in, in, on the bed. <laughs> Discontent. <laughs> Raise your door. But not only that, people don't have, I know, I know Moses had to have problems. <laughs> I'm, I'm on a 6'6". Six, six. I lay in the bed. It, the bed is this, this long. <laughs> Then they get a chair. They try to get a chair, put it on the end, pile some pillows up so my feet won't hang out. Does anybody have that problem here? That's discontent. <laughs> yes, mercy. Discontent, remorse, distress arising from a sense of guilt, self-reproach. Where I come from, they call it a pity party. But really, I wish I had known this. I would have trained my children. I wish I'd, I wouldn't have done this. You beat yourself up from past mistakes. You know what I'm saying? You're going to guilt. That's remorse. People let the past control their present. They don't know how to release that past. Distrust. To have no confidence. When I first started in this work here in Huntsville, then as time moved on, every black helicopter that flew around, mm -hmm. we got our eyes on it. Suspicion. Mm -hmm. No trust. Everything. Even carried on to the marriage. Therefore, you might have anybody here married? I want to pick on I'm married. You married? Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a personal question? Where's my husband? I, no. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, you, see, you're not thinking. You're not listening. Why want to go down there? I ain't going to ask you a, a personal question. No. Do y'all have separate bank accounts? No. All right. One. What y'all think about it? Anybody think? We're one. What's wrong? What's wrong with having two? I have a bank account. She has a bank account. My wife. What's wrong with it? It's better it? together when you have one. Why is better together? Because we're one. Okay. We but when it comes from a human respect, it's not better because I don't know when she's going to spend my money. All right, let's move on. <laughs> you, you're right. Okay. I do offer marriage coaching. Oh, that, that's all right. Let's move on. I do offer that. Uh -uh, no, 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 no. We just left a place. We just left a place last week. Woo! It became fire in there. Well, I was talking about marriage. Like you said, they won. No trust. <laughs> and we bring into our marriage past experience. See, when we get married, we marry history. Each one of us got suitcases. And we need to know that. But anyway, you're going to take my time talking about his two separate accounts. <laughs> oh, okay, I know. God's, I know. I'm not cutting you off. God's grace, God's grace is not his approval. Did you hear what I just said? God's grace is not his approval. We want to know how we got there. All right. Nobody going to hold that against you. I'm with you. Just come on outside after the meeting. <laughs> Courage, hope, faith, sympathy, love, promote health, and prolong life. Hmm? A contented, cheerful spirit is health to the body and strength to the soul. You got to minister to the emotions and the mental condition of every soul you're going to try to help. It's very important. A merry heart, do a good like medicine. That's what it says. Good for the bones. Nothing tends more to promote health of the body or the soul than does a spirit of gratitude. And if you take a sheet of paper, draw a line straight down the middle. Put all your disappointment on one side and all your blessing on another side. If you be honest with yourself, your blessing outweighs all the disappointment. All the disappointment. It's a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much a duty as it is to pray. Now let's get into this. So if the devil comes to steal life, then he must come to steal mental health. 
mental health. This is where the battle is fought, right here. Battleground. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has placed the world of eternity in our heart. So the Bible tells me, for as he thinketh, now keep this in mind, as he thinketh in his heart, so he. So action begins with thoughts. So you see, thoughts produce action, action continue, repeat it, produce habits, habits form character. And thus that character determines our destiny. So we're going to deal with a habit in our life, whether a bad habit, whatever habit is. You cannot attack the habit. You cannot deal with the habit. That's what modern behavioral sciences deal with habits. You've got to deal with the thought level. Are you following me? Now, when we talk about temptation in James, that object which you are tempted to is not your problem. It's the desire that's in your heart. If the desire is removed, that thing could be flashing all day long. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Not that you walk into it, but the desire must be addressed. What is prompting you? What is precipitating that object? Like TV used to be something I'd be addicted to. You know, like, you know once you get to know God and let that desire, you don't pray, God, will you take the TV from me? He'd take it, then you go to your friend's house. <laughs> desire. Get to the root. Get to the root of it. Desire. A sound man. God gave us a perfect love, not a, a sound mind. Perfect love. Romans 7, 25. With the mind, I serve the Lord God. With the mind. And Hebrews 18. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. I write them in their hearts. I will be to them as a God, and they shall be to my people. In ancient Israel, he wrote it on the table of stone. Now God wants to write it on the heart, in the mind, in the mind. Now, this is what I want to wrap up with you. There are four universal biblical laws. Now, we got a handout. We'll give you, we're going to give you this handout. We're going to give you another 7,720 pages. Where's Pastor O? He ain't listening to me. You got to take a free will off. No, <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to tell you if nothing happened with y'all today you have got your COVID shot I'm telling you you got your COVID shot now there's four universal biblical laws that form the foundation for mental, spiritual and even physical health and well being that's what I want to just share with you quickly here four principles number one what we think we are now listen to that what we think we are. Did you get that? Not what we think we are. What we think we are. You understand that? Number two, we reap what we sow. Number three, by beholding, we become changed. Number four, we overcome evil with good. Now let's repeat those again. What's number one? We think we are. Number two, Number three, and number four. That's right. So we're going to get this, put this in your hand as we end, all right? All right, let's, let's investigate this a little bit. Now, this comes from Neil Nelly. Some of us heard of Neil Nelly. It says, many erroneously believe that inherited traits, inherited traits are the primary factors determine their quality of life and how long they live, will live. For the vast majority of us, our health is primarily dependent on two factors. It goes in, number one, what we put into our bodies and what we do to our bodies. Okay? Now, not only just food, what we put here too. Okay? All right. Now, healthy and correct thoughts. Who decides what goes into our bodies and what we do with our body? We ourselves make those decisions. Keep that in mind. We ourselves make those decisions. And where do we make those decisions? In our minds. What we think, what we think will determine what we put into our bodies and what we do with our bodies. 
What we think now, what we think, and you might not be grasped, but what we think, this means that if we are experiencing true and lasting physical, mental, spiritual health, we must have healthy and correct thoughts. You remember we talked about incorrect perspective of God, incorrect? We must have correct, healthy thoughts. Luke 6, 45. Who has Luke 6, 45 real quick? If I want to read that, just shout it out loud. Luke 6, 45. Read that. We must have correct thinking. Yes, ma'am. Luke 6, 45. Very important. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's dealing with the mind. Out of the abundance of the heart. So, biblical principle number one. What we think we are. Proverbs 23, 7. You may not be what you think you are, but what you think you are. Did you get that? All right. Medical research confirmed this biblical law of the mind. Every time you have an angry thought, an unkind thought, or a sad thought, your brain releases chemicals that make your body feel bad. Hmm? Every time you have a good thought, a happy thought, a hopeful thought, or a kind thought, your brain releases chemicals that make your body feel good. These chemicals are hormones that charge from your brain through your blood vessels even down to your adrenal glands that will precipitate cortisol or adrenaline or suppresses your immune system. Your thinking, if it's thinking, thinking, it will suppress your immune system. You're taking all the herbs, which I, I believe in that, all the hydrotherapy, but you're an angry person. You wonder why your body is not responding. Keep this in mind, folks. It's very important. It goes on, Proverbs 4, 20, 20, 4, 20. As a man thinking, it says, it says, guard. It said, diligent, guard your heart, for out of it come the issues of life. That's what it says. Since our feelings, words, and action begin with our thoughts, we must carefully evaluate everything that enters our mind. Now we'll come out, what is feeding your mind? Well, electronically or with people. If you want to be a depressed people, hang around people that's already murmuring and complaining. You know, I tell, I tell my fellow workers, I say, look, that God is too good for me to be murmuring and complaining. The key is that once we understand that the things we're going through are quizzes in every circumstance, I shared that this morning, God for not every circumstance is designed for our good when we have a connection with God. Say, God, what is in this situation that you're trying to show me? We don't have to complain. That's what kept Israel out of the kingdom. Murmuring and complaining. Murmuring, murmuring and complaining. Remember, guard your thoughts and affection because they will determine the direction of your life. The scripture describes the consequence of our thought, what we choose to think about. Somebody pick up Mark 7. Read verse 20 and 23. I know they, they have a mic. Anybody want to read Mark 7? Give me a note. Yes, ma'am. Read it for me. 2023. Destructed evil thoughts. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Mark 7, 20 to 23. Go ahead, dear. And he said, that which cometh out of the mouth, out of the man, defileth the man. For, with, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceedeth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, mm -hmm. thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Mm -hmm. All these things come from within and defile the man. Did you, 
All of these evil things. All these evil. All these <clears throat> evil things. Where they come, come from? from within and defile the man. Out of the heart, which is the mind. Evil thoughts. Keep that in mind. Very important. All right. Somebody go to Galatians chapter 5. Raise your hand. Verse 22 and 23. Does anybody want to read Galatians 5? Donald, you get your ex you ain't going your digest walk. That's why you're getting your walk now. <laughs> but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Mm -hmm. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. You see, we have two sources or two categories of attributes that come from the mind. Evil thoughts or healthy thoughts. You get that? From the mind. Very important. Now, so therefore, the, what's the first principle? What we think we are, we are. Whatever we thinking, whatever we're thinking. If our mind is always on other people, they fall a mistake, or we thinking evil thoughts, that's what we are, ourselves. All we see is a reflection of the evilness in our own heart from other people. It's true. And that's why we don't know how to address the evil that's in other people's heart because we are also in bondage the same way they are in. That's why I said this morning we hold people hostage for something that they cannot deliver. Hmm? Anybody can repeat the last thing I just said? That's right. So our thinking, what we think we are, absolutely. Absolutely. If we think failure, we are failures. Hmm? We think we cannot conquer the territory for God. And just like Jericho, we look like grasshoppers. Stinking thinking. We, it's not enough against us. We have all of heaven. If you just have ten people that's lined up with God, truly surrender to God, that's just ten people, but you're not... God said, open my servant eyes. Let's see surrounding him. We do not believe that in the days of apostles, our angels showed up. We must walk in tension in a very spiritual realm that we have divine helpers with us. It's important what we think we are. Number two, we reap what we sow. We talk about gardening. We reap what you sow. Here's the point here. We must carefully guard our thoughts, Proverbs, because what we think we are, all right? The reason is found, biblical principle number two, we reap what we sow. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, that's why that's found. We reap what we sow. Job 4, 8, and Proverbs 22, 8. We reap what we sow, all right? Sowing. Sow false, sinful thoughts. Reap negative health damage feelings and action whatever we sow we're going to reap you sow love you're going to receive love now when you sow love you say well I, I, I love my spouse I love my husband I'm not getting it back oh it's going to come back somewhere you keep sowing what God wants you to sow God that's the word of God God states something he stands behind what he says but he's going to test your endurance he's going to test your faith you keep sowing you know, just like in marriage, I will share, with, share this little story where this marriage, there's three types of marriages. Enjoy, endure, escape. <laughs> three types of marriage. What did I say, preacher? Enjoy, escape. <clears throat> what do you think about that? So one night, these folks were in bed, and the wife got up, man. She got up. She started packing her suitcase. And all the noise, she tried to be silent, but he woke up. He said, honey, where you going? She said, I'm leaving you. That's right. He got up and packed his suitcase. She said, where you going? I'm going with you. I had, had an individual tell me that parents been married over 40-something years. And the husband decided, Children, children, grown and gone, he's done. But not only that, the guy now in his 60s, and now he, he married a younger person. Now let me ask you this. In that mind, what was that marriage? Was 
in the beginning? Was it in joy, endure? It was in enduring. It was enduring because enduring can go up or down. You know what I'm saying? But they did not nourish that marriage. We, when you get married, you, you begin to take things for, grant, things for granted. Now, like I said, I've been married 52 years, still don't take it for granted. I must still work on my marriage. You've got to work on it. You become too comfortable and say, well, she knows me by now. I mean, 50 years, I'm still finding out something about that funny woman. I mean, my wife. <laughs> huh? She got to go home with me. Woo! I might be cold, but I'm not old. I might be old, but not cold. <laughs> she got to go home with me. It takes two, okay? We sow what we reap, all right? Sow true godly thoughts, reap positive health building, feelings and action. So you're sitting, whether through the media, if there's not, nothing positive going through that, through that, it's not going to work. If you're hanging out with people that has nothing to affirm, just like when we was coming up here, I tell you, you know, Donald, you know, he, he drives, but sometimes I, live, I sleep on the brother, I said this before. But the conversation we had up, coming up here, that just fired my bones up. I mean, edifying conversation. You know, you don't want to sit around people always complain and say, well, man, how are we going to do this, man? Jack, uh, how are we going to, we ain't got no money. How are we going to get all up? I, I had to point him to the word. You, you had to fight. You got to saturate your mind with the truth to keep that enemy from coming in. Because God said what? When the enemy comes in, he'll raise up a standard. If you don't have nothing in you, you have nothing to defend you. It's very, reap what you sow. God has given this law to man because he wants us to have the freedom to choose. If we have no choice, there would be no reason to think. We will be robots. However, it takes diligent, diligent work to cultivate. Cultivate. What does the word cultivate mean? Just like this. You got, to, you got to plan. You got to work with it. So it, these thoughts don't come by osmosis. You got to work with it. You got to saturate your mind with it. You got to cultivate it. A healthy thought life. We can learn a lesson from the garden. It does not take, listen to this, it does not take any effort for weeds to multiply. Just don't do nothing. <laughs> but it takes diligent work to cultivate the soil for flowers, vegetables, fruit to grow and produce well. Because of mankind's sinful nature, it takes more effort to cultivate true, positive thoughts than to produce false, negative thoughts. If you're not producing positive thought, by default, you're going to have negative thoughts. This is like we're talking about. You know, a person don't have two choices in regards to salvation. They have one choice. If you do not choose Jesus, by default, you choose Satan. You, by default. You don't have to say, I choose Satan. Just don't choose Jesus. Am I making sense to two people in here? Yeah. The garden of the heart must be cultivated. Just like you talk about garden. It got to be cultivated. The soil must be broken up by deep repentance for sin. Poisonous, satan satanic plants must be uprooted. The soil once overgrown by thorns can be reclaimed only by diligent labor. So the evil tendencies of the natural heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and the strength of Jesus Christ. We got to tax that mind. The Lord bids us by his prophet, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, Jeremiah 4, 3. Hosea 10, 12. This work he desired to accomplish for us. I'm going to read that again. This work, what he desired? He desired to do what? To accomplish for us. Now, how does that play out? Now, Christ said he will accomplish this work. Now, what is required of us for Christ to accomplish his work? We got to cooperate. We got to be like we said this morning. That you got to surrender your will to him. You got to say, Lord, here I am. I give you permission. You know, we're told, those who are familiar with the book, Christ's Object Lesson, page 159. Christ's Object Lesson, page 159. It says, the language of the heart would be, Lord, I give you consent to take this heart of mine. 
because I cannot give it to you. Keep it pure for that name's sake because I cannot keep it for you. Save me in spite of my unchristlike weak self. Fashion, shape, and mold this heart until it become entirely like Jesus Christ. And raise me up into the pure atmosphere of heaven that is rich current of love. And I, I'm not adding to God's word, but I said, let that rich current of love flow through me to my wife, to my fellow workers, to my children. See, we cannot even give God our heart. We got to give him permission. Christ object lesson page 159. Very important to understand that. Medical science recognized that emotions such as fear, sorrow, envy, resentment, and hatred are responsible for the major of our sickness. Now, they estimate vary from 60% to nearly 100%. So when you go to your primary health care giver in the hospital, they don't deal with your emotions. They don't know what's traumatizing your life that's causing that. That's why God said, told his people to raise up in your own hospitals and own schools to be able to dress the whole person. Sanitarian work. It says emotional stresses, emotional stresses can cause high blood pressure. Because when you're stressed out, your blood vessels constrict. When you are, now let me say something about stress. Is stress, uh, uh, it, no, 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 listen, uh, you know what, you, I'm, I got a class I teach. No, no, I, I heard you clearly. <laughs> I wouldn't do this if you didn't do it the second time. Three strikes, you out. I'm going to take you and put you in the back of the class. <laughs> you drop your phone. My, my, my uh-uh. Now, my see, that's... Ten years ago, she... Oh, ask her what she said. Ask her, ask her. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, you better say something. <laughs> you, you read there where Adam and Eve was when they disconnected themselves from God. And there are symptoms in that passage where they blame one another. See, uh-huh. blame. Hmm. <laughs> now... There's two types of communication. Now this, listen, no, stop looking at her, she's doing, she ain't said one thing. Her eyes, I'm looking, I'm peripheral. I, I see what's going on, I see Cuke over here, I see other, I see people. But, but you right in front of my class, picking that phone up. You right there and flunking the class, woman. Now there's two types of communication. Now listen, because I'm going to finish this, two types. You have what you call assertive communication. That means you're able to communicate exactly what you want the person to understand. Now, communication doesn't mean you all come in agreement, but at least you can understand assertive. I mean, you got to be very, you can't be generalized. You got to be very specific that they can repeat that. That's assertive. Then the other one's very important active listening. <laughs> now, these are principles. I'm not making up. Active listening. Now, I can be talking. Or I can be counseling because I'm very, attentive. and you can be shaping already in your mind how you're going to respond to me, and you're not even listening. Anyone you know what I'm saying? Because you're already developing a way you're going to communicate back with me or defend yourself. So, active listening, you affirm, you're paying attention, watching body language, and you are not forming any opinion. You're trying to get understanding of that person's position. Now, Aren't you glad that God's a God of second chances? <laughs> Aren't you glad of that? Now, I'm going to try to finish. Try to finish. Okay. Good. <laughs> Is that your sister for real? What I want to ask her. Are you the oldest or the youngest? You're the youngest. I know you're not. You can't. Yeah, you, you're very mellow. Well, on the outside. <laughs> but listen to this. It says overactive thyroid gland. You know, I don't know how many years ago, 20 something years ago, you know, I was conducting a field school in British Columbia. And man, I'm already a slim guy. And I got up 
my soup was not fitting me right. I was tired and sweating, etc. And I'm always, I, I lost a lot of pounds. But anyway, I, I had hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. Traveling all around the world, and then I had to come home and check myself into our own health center. I went to my, I, I'm serious. Well, we, I, we do that once a year because we just, we, I just went through a 10 day and 18 day program. You got, but I went to my endocrinologist. He said, Well, okay, you need thyroid medication. I said, You know, I said, Okay, doc. I had a friend, he passed away. He said, You know, and please understand this. He said, I go to the doctor. I know he has to live. He gave me a prescription. I take it to the pharmaceutical company. I buy it. I know the pharmacist got to live. I take it home and throw it in the garbage because I know I got to live. <laughs> Don't wait. Don't take that advice. I'm just as a joke now. But when, but when I went, <laughs> but when I went to him, he said that you got to take thyroid medicine. Now I know more about the adrenal glands, so I said no. I see the balls are coming. I'm almost finished. So I know hyperthyroid stress. Now stress. This was stress. Stress is essential, and it is valuable to human growth. Stress. You put stress, you run, you stress muscle, you tax your mind, that's stress. Now stress becomes destructive when the intensity and duration exceeds my or your capacity to respond in a healthy way. So intensity, that's the strength. Duration, that's the length. So it's how you respond to it. This is what the biblical laws of health. You cannot get rid of, rid of stress. Jesus was not stressed out, but his life was filled with stress. Are you with me? All right, so don't be talking about if I can get rid of this stress. You're talking the wrong language. It's how you respond to it. All right? So we find here, it says here, a, as physicians, we can prescribe medicine for symptoms of disease, but we cannot do much for the underlying cause emotional turmoil. Hmm? Now listen, nine-tenths, this comes from Inspire, nine-tenths of disease is of a spiritual nature. That's 90% of all diseases. You name me a disease, it falls in that category. Nine-tenths. Listen to what it says. Satan is the originator of disease. Therefore, cancer, diabetes, you name it, originator. Now, if there was no sin, would there be diseases? No. So the problem is a sin problem. You ain't get what I'm saying. It's a sin problem that's holding us in bondage. This is what it says here. And the physician is warned against his work and power. Sickness of the mind prevails, every, prevails everywhere. Nine ten of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Right here. It says, what I have to thought. Is it possible? That persistent, inappropriate thinking can upset the balance of chemicals in the body and brain to detriment of psychological function. Is it possible that excessively high or low emotional experience can upset the balance of chemicals in both body and brain to detriment of psychological function? The overwhelming evidence of science today is that the brain and body interact with amazing intimacy. Can't separate the two. Cannot separate. So we read that the relation that exists between the mind and the body is intimate. When one is affected, the other sympathizes. The condition of the mind affects the health to a far greater degree than many realize. The mind, the, the mind of Christ. Arm yourself with the same mind. It says, praise God by thinking his thoughts. We reap not only healthful feelings, but emotions, but also a better physical health and well-being. Number three, as we're coming on down, understanding that a person <coughs> reap what they sow in his thoughts, life stresses the importance of this third principle. By beholding, we become changed. By beholding. Put your faith, not in Facebook, but faith book. Hmm? <laughs> Did you get that? Put your face there. Whatever we, now, whatever we choose to behold through our senses, eyes, ears, etc., 
directly affects our thoughts, feelings, and responses to life situation. In order to change the way we feel and act, we must change the way we think by choosing only good and spiritually inspired information upon which to feed our thoughts. These are key steps, practical steps. So we find the spiritual experience, the mental powers, the physical life, touch, sight, taste, smell, hearing. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If those things are protected, it will upset that whole structure. Somebody read Philippians 4 8 as we come. Philippians 4 8 for me. Raise your hand. You know it? Anybody want to read that for us real quickly? We're going to move on quickly. What does Finally, it say? brethren, whatsoever things are true, mm -hmm. whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are... Wait a minute. <laughs> Page. It's all right there. <laughs> whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, mm -hmm. if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Amen. I think we read that before, but we need to make the application to it. How to feed the mind. Let's go to the last one here. Principle number four, overcome evil with good. As the previous three unchangeable biblical laws are diligently applied to every situation in life, they bring not only relief, but heaven's healing. How does this happen? It is by overcoming evil with good. That's Romans 12, 21. If we try to overcome one evil with another evil, we only reap more evil. That's right. Clear as day. Clear as day. Instead, overcome evil with good, scripture truths. The word of God is the basis. Just as Christ overcomes same temptation, you remember that? In Matthew chapter 4, 43, he overcame the evil with the word of God, with good. He did not get in a conversation tit for tat. Just the word of God. Now, it says we can overcome the destructive habits. Listen now. We can overcome the destructive habits of response in our lives, whether they are from ungodly thoughts and feelings, negative attitudes, health damaging words and action. These are things that really destroys our health. Destroys our health. The word of God. Listen to what it says, book education. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word. Now remember, when you're reading the Bible, you're reading the very thoughts of God, the very power that created this world. The word. That means you, when you're taking that word, that word is able to create in you, create in you a whole new heart. You don't see that. You, you say, man, it got to be some more mechanics about it. By beholding, you become changed. Now, this is how you got to approach it. I'm told in inspiration, it says that when you read the word of God, you need to see what God has put in that verse. You need to tax your mind to that verse until that verse becomes your thought. Mercy. Did you hear that? You, don't, you just don't get up and read the Bible and say, okay, I read my passage today and set it down. You must tax your mind until that verse becomes your thought. Because when you engage in conversation, contention, then you're not going to speak your words. The word of God is going to come out in such a practical way that going to arrest the contention, I know. You got to tax your mind. You got to tax it. So that verse become your thoughts. And I guarantee you, the majority of us never study that way. We just read, we memorize it, but it don't become our thoughts. We must gain the position where we think the thoughts of God. We must begin to put ourselves in a position that we can think like God thinks. That was my father, Adam, in the beginning. Beliefs originate from the inf information we have repeatedly allowed to enter our minds 
through our five senses. If you keep hearing over and over, you know, over and over, over and over again. It says the way that we respond to situation in life comes from our belief, habits of thinking and feelings. When we have meanings, we approach it from our own perspective because we've been shaped our belief pattern. It goes on and says here, by God's enabling grace, we overcome health damaging habits of response as false. That's how we overcome. Make a decision to keep as many negative things as possible from coming into your mind. Psalm 101. There's certain things you have control. That's why, you know, news, I look at news, get some weather, but when they start talking crazy stuff, click or get rid of it. I'm saying I cannot further or remove it at all. Computer, when the stuff flash up. Now, I got a, I got a face type of cut, my folks, but I'm very seldom putting anything on it. But my folks do it, but I don't even go through that. And I'm not knocking them, I'm saying I got a guard because God revealed to me there's still some hidden traits in my character that I was not happy with this week that just exploded. So I know where that come from. You get what I'm saying? When you're conscious of that, you want to overcome. Be willing to reexamine and challenge with the authoritative standard of God's word, the knowledge we may hold in our hearts that leads to any unhealthy belief. We got to bring that into subjection. You see the scriptures up there. Replace any false knowledge with true. Health promoting knowledge. Then bring our words, attitudes, and action into harmony with the new healing thoughts. Even if we face many trials, listen to this, in the process. We're going to face some trials, but that's no indication that God is not with you. Because remember, that's a battle, a spiritual battle. Spiritual battle. Power. We need a constant sense of the noble power of pure thoughts. The only security for any soul is right thinking. As a man thinketh, so is he in his heart. The power of self-restraint strengthens my exercise. That which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy until right thoughts and action become habitual. If we will, we may turn away from all that is cheap and inferior and rise to a higher standard. We may be respected by men and be loved by God. Very important. Christ standing at that door and opening that door. The Holy Spirit will prick that heart. We just like to let him, let him in. Before we close out, can anybody tell me three things you can remember from the biblical laws of the mind? As a man, as a man thinking in his heart, so is he. What we reap will be so good. Amen. Y'all didn't go to sleep on us. That's good. That's good. On the computer, there's a control button. Control. You know what need to be? We need to delete control. That's right. You ain't get what I just said. You did not. Preacher, did they get what I said? They didn't get what I said. Dele delete control because we are control freaks. We all have God complex in us. We're control free. Delete control out of your life. Huh? Raise. Hey. Wave the white flag. <laughs> and throw down your weapons of how to address evil. Throw down your weapon how to deal with those difficult in marriage. And pick up God's weapon, which is spiritual. Sur surrender. By the blood of the Lamb, surrender at that door that I might dwell in them. Here's that statement as we close. Can we read this together where it says no out? Let's read this together. Let's read what it says. No outward observance can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul would be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. 
Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. That, that needs, page 159. 159. Lord is good. I can do all things in Christ who strengthen me. All things. May God keep us. May God grace us as we face the challenges of a new week. May what we address this morning in the stand we took for the Lord. Amen. That we want to give him permission to become the governor of our lives. Amen. Let's leave that on there for those who are watching. And those that want to give a donation, they can send it right here, right? And I know that you mm -hmm. do have some needs for your ministry, for the ministry. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Are you laughing again? <laughs> <laughs> we just want to leave it up there yeah. for the viewing audience. If you want to, um, if we, the, we don't have we have projects that we try projects, to, projects projects. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> projects. <laughs> Amen. And if you want to um, support the gospel work uh, at Meet Ministry, yeah. uh, we can definitely do yeah. that. If if we have any brochures left, just about the there ministry. should be some in the back. Some in the back. You can pick that up. All right. Amen. Pastor, we thank you very much. Oh, man. We that we're able to come back and be with our family. I pray Amen. that. Amen. We, we praise God for the contribution of meat ministry. And um, we must all embrace the let's bring this, let's bring this over to take the table. We must all embrace the medical missionary work for huh? The handout. We're gonna get that. Oh, yeah. We must all embrace the medical missionary work. And as we get ready to transition, what we want to do is we want to close out the Sabbath. Amen. Let us pray. Let us kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, as we close out this Sabbath, Lord, as we transition into a new week, as we get ready for part two, we want to pray that you will forgive us of anything we've done this week, even on this day. And we ask that you will wash us in the blood. Father God in heaven, we ask you to empty us of self, Lord, for we are so selfish. So Lord, empty us of ourselves and fill us with yourself. Bless the ministry of Thomas Jackson and his wife, and I just pray that you will continue to bless them in their marriage, Lord. Thank you for their, not just their ministry, but their friendship, Lord God. We don't look at them just as a brother, but as a friend, Lord God. And as a minister in the ministry, but as a friend. So bless us as we transition into a new week, and bless us as we do part two in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yeah. All right, Richard, you can take it off the screen as we get ready to transition. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. Are the final movements going to be rapid ones? Um, are things getting ready to take place? Well, brothers and sisters, I need you to fasten your seatbelts because I have something to show you. Can I just show you two things that we can get out, three things we can get, get you out of here? Can I show you a video that just came out last week where the Christian nationalists said that we're all Christian nationalists now? And they said that we have only two choices, either Christian nationalism or Molech nationalism. Brothers and sisters, the image of the beast which we know will be apostate Protestantism, is soon to develop. And we are about to see some things happen that you would scarce, I'm sorry, Elder, Again, scarcely that. dream of. Can you just put that in there for me, please? Let me bring that around. Things and events that we've scarcely dreamed of, thank you very much, are soon to take place. And the purpose of of these programs that we're doing, bringing a uh, medical missionary such as Dr. Jackson and others here, is to prepare you to give you the tools that you need and understand, you know, we're called to be God's helping hand in the finishing of the work. Amen? Amen. 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 So what we're going to do is we're going to ask for Pastor Davis to come up. Is Marcus Mason here? I see Sister Mason here, so... I was wondering her son was somewhere nearby. All right. But brothers and sisters, can we show you what's getting ready to happen? All right. All right. All right. Can we show you what's getting ready to happen? Um, where's the other microphone at? All right. 
All right. Thank you. All right. Can you give that to Pastor Davis? Okay, we got that. We're going to get that other microphone here. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Give that to him. All right. All right. Now, um, Pastor Davis, how are you doing today, my brother? Great, by God's grace. Great. Amen. All right. Now, brothers and sisters, in Revelation chapter 13, how many beasts are we referring to? In Revelation chapter 13, how many beasts are we, refer are we referring to? Two. Now, before we get started, we want to make a couple of announcements. Let's go to the screen, Brother Richard. Um, what we want you to know is, um, is this right here. Now, we want to make a couple of announcements. Now, next week, uh, Jeremy Serrato and his wife, we want you to look at the screen. Um, there will be a family camp starting on March the 15th to the 17th. Advent Age Mission presents family camp. Free invitation to an insightful event covering crucial yet often overlooked topics. Opportunity to gain valuable insight into the mental health crisis within the church. Understanding the pivotal role of the family in society. Learning practical strategies for successful marriages. Navigating relationship issues and embracing true education for positive spiritual development. And preparation for increasingly difficult times ahead. It begins on March 15th to the 17th in Haleyville. You see the address on here. And you can go for more details at AdventAgeMissions.com. Uh, Brent and Anika uh, Krishan, Jason, I mean Joshua White, and Dr. Lindsey Burgess. And we thank God for them. Brothers and sisters, for those of you that are in the Chattanooga area, two weeks from now, we will be uh, at the Apison Seven Day Adventist Church. And <laughs> my dear brother, Brother Bowen, and if you are in, the, uh, in that area, we would like for you to come out. He has sent this thing all over to like so many churches. He has sent this even to the conference. Have mercy. So we're looking for a packed house. Now, brothers and sisters, we understand what's getting ready to come down. And so I just got this in the email today. Somebody sent this to me. This is our latest um, a billboard in Cookville, Tennessee. We've been putting these billboards up. And these are some set people right here. They, they just sent this to me. They took a picture right in front of the billboard. And we thank yes, God for the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen. Amen. But I want to, before we get started, we want to start with a sobering thought. You know, even though we have the truth and we've been presenting the oh. truth, I want to just present something here. When people come in contact oh. with the truth, it's sometimes too what, somebody? Shocking yeah. to believe. Why? Yes. Because our lives have been built on lies, even with all the facts presented. Do you know that there are some people that may choose still not to accept it? And that's the reality. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, where are we at right now? Let's go to the Bible. The Bible says, let's read it together. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause it as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Will there be a death decree in the last days, Pastor Davis? Yes. And it will come as a result of this beast power, the second beast forming an image to the beast but the bible says we should not make no raven image am i right and neither are we to bow down and worship before it am i right am i right pastor that's right so all so this second beast power pastor davis is symbolic of who the united states of america and just come on a little bit closer in yes it's symbolic of the united states of america the bible says this beast power would come out of the where somebody earth. the earth but the first beast comes up out of the where the sea. So we see this beast power rising up somewhere different than in Western Europe. And this power is going to cause the whole world to wander after the beast. So the lamb will turn into a beast. Technically, it is a beast. It has two horns like a what? Lamb. It's a Christian country. It claims to be like lamb-like, but it speaks as a who? Dragon. And brothers and sisters, a lot of draconian things are happening in society. As you have seen, you have seen political leaders putting up these hand signs. Do you understand this right here? Do you, have you seen political leaders put up hand signs? That tells you that something's going on in this country. And even the former pope had, did the same thing. Have mercy. Have, have mercy. Have you, have you seen this before? So what happens is, is that world leaders are coming together. And a change is coming. Ellen G. White says that the Sunday movement is now making its way in what, somebody? Darkness. The leaders are concealing the what issue? True issue? 
And it says that many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whether the undercurrent is what? They are working in what? So as we present what the Christian nationalists are doing, God has told us that they're walking in darkness. Am I right? In blindness. We know the two major figures. The second beast power is going to enforce the mark of Rome's authority, which will be Sunday worship when enforced by a what law, somebody? And we know that the number of the beast 666 is tied into sun worship. The papacy says that Sunday is their mark of what? Now, does anybody have the mark of the beast yet? No. No one has yet received the mark of the beast because the testing time has not yet come. Now, understand this right here. The Bible says when you break one commandment, how many have you broken? When you go to this, if you worship the beast in his image, you'll be violating the first two commandments. If you receive the mark in the name of the beast, you'll be violating the third and the fourth. You see how this all ties in together. And what's going on right now, there is an agitation why a rest day could help fight climate change. And it sounds familiar, right? And we know that Sunday is founded not on scripture, but on what, somebody? And it's distinctly a Catholic institution. We know the truth that Sunday is not the Sabbath. Do you understand this? It is not the Lord's day. I was, um, what, what, what race am I? I'm African. Okay, I know, brother, <laughs> brother, 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 brother Barnett says brother African. Yes, that's true. But when you say, when, when, I, when you say, what race am I? You say Negro. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody uses that term no more, right? It is very evident that I am black, right? Am I right? If I told you that I am white, you know that's not true. Am I right? Now, brother, my brother here, my brother from the same Heavenly Father, he's white. Am I right? If he said he was black, it may be some truth to it, right? If he said that, right? Because of that what drop rule. But the bottom line is, you know that I'm what? Black. Okay. The point I'm making is just because if I, if I say I'm something other than black, then you'd be like, you got to be lying, right? So to say that Sunday's the Lord's day when it's not, it would be a lie. Am I right? Can I tell you the truth about Sunday? Saturday is the Christian Sabbath because it was made by Christ. Do you understand this? Is there a great controversy going on right now? Yes. It's between Christ and Satan. It's about who you're going to worship. But Sunday is the what Sabbath? Is, is that, am I right, Sister Mason? Would your husband agree, agree with that? Yes. Amen. Sunday is the Satanic Sabbath because his name is Satan, right? So if it comes from him, it's Satanic, right? That's right. Let me let Brother... Pastor, okay, what, what, what's, what's Sunday? Sunday is the Luciferian Sabbath. Is it Luciferian? Yes. Why? It's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit. It came from Satan. It came from Satan, which his name is Lucifer. And yeah. read that one. Sunday is the devil Sabbath. Why? It, it comes from the devil. It's a lie. It's demonic. It's the father it's, of lies. It's the father of lies, right? <laughs> and then look at this one. Sunday is the devil's day. As a day of worship. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not telling people that they're worshiping the devil. But we're just telling you the nature of it, am I right? If you was thirsty and you saw a clear glass of water, and Brother Barnett, you said, Pastor, before you drink, I need to let you know that's poison. And you could prove it was poison. But I said, nah, it is water because it looks like water. Would that, and if he was right, would it save me from the results of drinking it? No. So what happens is Sunday may feel like the Sabbath. Because on Sunday, you know, things kind of die down and stuff. It has a song, it has a feeling to it, right? But so does Monday on national holidays. Yes, sir. She mean the commandments of men. Now, this thing is thank you, my brother. Now, understand, can we agree that the Sunday law is going to be the final test? Will we be tested? Will we be commanded to receive a mark in their right hand and our forehead, or we can't buy ourselves? But let me ask you this right here. Satan is going to use deception. What, what do you see this right here? It says, remember, they're always with you. Is that true? That's called spiritualism. Because didn't the spirit of prophecy that the Protestants would be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism? When Satan and his demons, do you understand this? 
come in human form to tell us that the Sabbath's been changed and we need to go along with this agenda. Is this serious? Ellen G. White says, look at this right here. Those who will stand in the time of peril must understand the testimony of the scriptures regarding the nature of man and the state of the what? Dead. dead. The dead know not what? Anything. Can, um, can you get this microphone to give to Brother Barnett? Uh, all right. Yes. Yes. So listen to this. For in the near future, when? Many will be confronted by the spirits of the dead, excuse me, confronted by the spiritual devils, personating beloved relatives or what? That's right. Or friends. That's what you want to say, Elder? exactly what I want to comment on. Go ahead. So we know that artificial intelligence is one of the things that the enemy is using right now to right. create right. counterfeit. Right. So a couple of weeks ago, Donnie Shelton showed where there's a company in California, I think, where they produce... Like if my wife, my wife is dead now. Right. The company can produce Laverne's Barnett voice Ooh. with her saying real things in so-called real time wow. about any topic. Yeah. And they are not, they say that they don't manipulate the, 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 the technology. But right. I think they do. Because she can be saying like anything, like how she wants to be buried. Right. Uh, what we should be doing today, we, the, you know, the ones who have been left behind, right, uh, are still alive, rather, and it's all about oh, AI, artificial intelligence, yes. can imitate that person's voice right. just like it's her voice, and they have a screen where they are showing her speaking, mm. yes, and you believe that she's alive, in the company of and family members can ask her question, right, and she is answering them now as if she's there. Exactly. Yeah. And see, and we, we see this a lot with these funerals where people say, well, I mean, not just funerals, but when a person's birthday comes by, you know, there may be somebody in your family, Brother Barnett, next year when your wife's birthday comes, happy heavenly birthday, Laverne. She's not in heaven. She's in the grave waiting for Jesus to come. Am I right? Right. Right. See, and see what happens is this right here. Spiritualism is very serious. Understand, it's going to be when spiritualism comes involved in this and when when the spirits of the dead, when Satan comes as the spirits of the dead to speak to us, to tell us that the Sabbath has been changed and that we need to go along with this on the agitation. A lot of people going to believe it. It should deceive the very elect. This thing's going to be so deceptive. Now, I see his hand. Now, think about it for a minute. Ellen White says in Great Controversy that the counterfeit's going to be perfect. Same look, same tone. Now, Sister um, Shelly, I know your sister passed away, but if something comes to your room tonight saying, girl, I've just been watching over and speaking that Bermudian accent, it's going to sound just like her. It's going to look like her. But guess what? It won't be her. It will be Satan coming as an angel of what? What should you do when that happens? Should you have a conversation with the devil? You say, in the name of Jesus, the dead know not what? Anything. And you know, Brother Barnett, you know, yeah, huh? Get thee behind me, Satan. And then the devil, you're like, Vernon? And you know how your wife used to talk to you. She may call you by whatever sweet name, whatever. Your Jamaican name. I know you have a Jamaican name and stuff like that. All right, they do, they do. In Honduras, they have different names for people. And it would sound just right. Come on, it, it, it really is me, Vernon. Come on. Remember what I told you before? I'll be back. But you cannot talk to the devil because the, if the devil, the devil will talk you into hell. Yes, my brother. It's even going further because Satan does have control of this mechanism. Yes. There has been plenty of people who have done these things right. and have stated there is only information that I know yeah. that it has told me. Right. See. So you can see the fact of, remember, he has his angels following people. He knows, he knows. our innermost, innermost scenes that have done. And yeah. he will recall that. And that will, no one knows that secret except my beloved. That's no, right. And that's what's going to sell it. And let's go on. And it says here, 
and declaring the most dangerous heresies, these visitants will appeal to our tenderest what? Sympathies. And will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. That's where it's going to really, this is where it's really going to hit the fan. We must be prepared to withstand them with the Bible truth that the dead know not what? And that they who thus appear are the spirits of who? I see you. You can give it to her. You see that young man in the casket? You know what the world says? Oh, that's just the shell. The real him is in heaven watching over you. You didn't stand this. I don't want to hear nobody talking about Moses Mason going to be preaching here next Sabbath. Well, if I tell you Moses Mason, you know, I talked to Moses Mason, and, and he's, he's going to make an appearance here. I mean, that's crazy, but if I see he's going to, Maggie, he said, Maggie, you have a front row seat. You ain't coming. Am I right? So you got to understand, and I'm not playing with that, but just, just understand this thing on the state of dead, dead is real. Do you understand this? This thing is real. This thing is real. Yes, my sister. So, based on what um, Elder Barnett was saying, this week I saw a video going around that they showed, my family was showing it on the group. It was Trump saying stuff about Jamaica. So, they just had um, local government elections out there. Right. And he was saying stuff that they were following his style and they are plagiarizing him and all of that. But he wasn't saying it. It was AI that they used to do it. So, mm. when they put it on the group, I said, this is not him talking. I said, it's not him, it's AI, and AI is doing a whole lot of stuff. So I therefore said to them, if you see a video going around saying I'm, that I'm saying stuff about you guys and doing stuff and all of that, it's not me. Come to me first and ask. It, it's not me, and the devil is going to use a whole lot of these things to, you know, a lot of families, like myself and my family, we are very close. We live very good. So the enemy will use stuff like this to you know, yes, right. bringing the family and to have family against each other. That's right, my dear brother. And then we got to go on. Majority of the time when we use, look at AI, AI is an algorithm. Mm -hmm. It is used to, te to learn where they write the, those programs and right. all of that. It is used to learn. So for instance, AI will watch a video, they will use a video with AI to duplicate your voice and it will duplicate it perfectly. Mm. Just like Siri. If you say, Siri, do this. Because if you notice, Siri used to do, turn on your radio, do this, and so forth. Now AI is just the advancement of series. All it does is just an just a, a algorithm that they use and to advance it by programming language, which it comes straight back to learning you. Yes, this thing is serious. So, pretty soon, everything's going to be closed. No mark, nor sale. Do you understand this right here? This thing is, yes. I was just going to say that I was watching this uh, video, and it was about AI, and they had made, I thought I was looking at Tom Cruise. And it was not com Tom Cruise. It was a robot. That, ha that they had made, it looked so human, and it looked just like Tom Cruise. And it said, oh, you thought I was Tom Cruise. He said, but no, I am a robot. And it's talking and moving mm -hmm. and everything and running and flipping and everything just like a human. Wow. But wow. it wasn't, it was not him. Wow. Brothers and sisters, we're going to um, show you a couple of things that has just transpired that it is very important for me to show you. Brothers and sisters, now um, look at this. Do you know that there is a thing called Dear Sunday Skin Care? Yes, Dear Sunday Skin Care. Oh man, I'm telling you, I'm going to, um, we're going to get back to that in a minute. But I got to show you this video. This is, now, listen, let me tell you this. See, this Sunday law is going to happen through church and state coming together through the image of the beast. Am I right, Brother Pastor? Amen. Now, let's watch this video right quick. Now, we're going to just get to the gist of this. Listen to this. We've allowed ourselves to be ruled politically by those who ignore the godly biblical foundation of our great country. It's time that, this, that Christ followers get politically active and bring the kingdom down to earth, especially in all 570,000 plus elected offices in this country. You see, you see what he's saying, right? 
We need to bring the kingdom of God to all this. So church and what comes together? State. It's time for you to get involved. Faith Wins is dedicated to engaging pastors, congregations, and Christians in the public arena. Why? Because the influence of Christians needs to be felt around the country. We are good for this country. There are 80 million eligible voters in the Christian community, but only 30 million participate on a regular basis. In 2024, this needs to change by the millions, by the tens of millions. And Chad Conley is going to tell you why in just a minute. I'm Jim Brangenberg. Check us out online at faithwins.org, faithwins.org. Chad Conley, welcome back to the Faith Wins Podcast. Hey, my brother. What's up, man? Appreciate you a lot. So I, I want to I talk a little bit about some of the attacks on you and some of the things that are attacks on generally on the Christian population in this country. What is Christian nationalism? Yes. What is Christian nationalism? Sometimes the videos are loud, some of them are not. Brothers, what is Christian nationalism? Well, Brother Barnett asked the question. Look at it. No, he didn't ask the question. That man asked the question. Hold on, hold on, Larry. Hold on, hold on. Now, we're going to get to this. Now, we're going to show you what's going on now. In the yeah faith wins look at this right here faith wins and it's called the american what somebody restoration tool. and it says american restoration and look what text they're using right here. what bible text do you see there it has isaiah chapter 58 verse 12 which is the repairer of the what so what are they trying to say that to um, restore america means to repair the what but how do you repair the breach according to verse 13? The Sabbath. So true Sabbath. the true Sabbath. But see, what they're going to be pushing is the false Sabbath. And guess what I found? Listen to this right here. What I really like about Faith Wins is that it's a nonpartisan organization. They don't push for a party, but we know which party really is going to be pushing. But rather promotes the believer's responsibility of voting for our values. Godly values, faith wins along with the great historian Dave Barton, educate citizens on America's Judeo-Christian founder and demonstrate how voting from a what kind of view has made the difference historically. historically. Now listen to this right here. Uh, they are talking about, okay, is it events I'm looking for? Look at this right here. It says, America's founding principles guided by what kind of values? are under attack before in, never, like never before in history. The responsibility is the church to find its voice and preserve the what, somebody? And they talk about this American restoration tour. They talk about taking action. The church must have a what? And the Bible says the image of the beast will both speak. Am I right? So she will have a voice. Do you understand this? And so they're talking about getting everybody together in essence we know what we know what this is leading to the union of church and what somebody state and i cannot find what they're talking what i was trying to find here but do we see that this is serious yes. do you see that they are serious about trying to take over do you understand this so i've got to show you this video the video says we're all christian nationalists are you ready for this I'm going to, I see the hand. I'm going to show you something. You're going to see in this video, this Christian nationalist says that all elected officials, in order to be real, they have to know their Bibles. And he, this man in this video says that in order, he talks about the day of rest, and you'll see what he says by it. And you'll know that they definitely do want a Sunday law. Listen to this. All legislators and it follows that if you are going to install legislators and judges in your nation, they must establish human law and rule according to the higher measure, which includes both natural and biblical law. Should Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. So isn't that what the image of the beast is all about? What you want to say about that, my brother? Yeah, so uh, what I'm seeing so far in these videos, what they're trying to do is, especially in that first video, mm -hmm. and he's pretty much saying the same thing. They're trying to set up this, the kingdom of God here on this earth. Uh, they're trying to uh, establish biblical principles 
enforce it by, enfor by enforcing it by law. But Jesus, he said in John chapter 18, verse uh, 36, he says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would With my, my servants fight, fight him. that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. I, I didn't come to, to try to uh, do what they're doing here. Right. That's not what Jesus uh, did. And so what they're doing is contrary to what the Bible is saying. Yes. Um, I was just basically on that on that line. Gotcha. You you can't you can't anytime you try to legislate conscious your conscience you're you're on the wrong side of the fence. Um, I was going to speak to one other thing that um, that we had addressed before about uh, AI and all that. Anytime you have artificial intelligence that is gathering information and speaking, beware of that as well. Um, I remember when my daughters had the little toy called the Furbies, and they memorize they they picked up on your vocabulary. Um, we hadn't spoken of anything that had to do with fear or anything like that, but my dad had given each of my daughters a Furby. My youngest daughter put it in the room. She went in there, but she was worried about her grandfather. Right. And literally, that thing asked her, "Are you worried?" Wow. See. And she, she looked and she goes, no. And she goes to walk away and says, are you worried? Mm. So it keeps speaking to her like that. She like got a Ouija scared. board. Exactly. So anytime you have this artificial intelligence thing, beware. Because the enemy can use that. Yes. Just like any kind of board, any kind of thing you're asking questions, any of that, beware of it because the enemy can get involved. That's right. Um, we've been praying over a little girl who just got possessed in Jamaica right? Playing with some little kid's game, supposedly, with pencils and yes and no answers. So, wow. again, this is not just, this is, this is like an adult game, game, but it's no game. That's right. Now, let's show you this video. We're going to pick this thing bit by bit. I want you to hear lines in here. You hear what they're saying. Should such men be educated in the higher measure? Of course they should be. A clip from MSNBC went viral last week in which Heidi Prisbola of Politico laid her finger on the perceived hallmark of Christian nationalism. Quote, the one thing that unites all of them as Christian nationalists, she explained, is that they believe our rights as Americans don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. Now, this is the kind of moment for which we thank God. It is wonderfully clarifying. While Ms. Prisbola seems shockingly unaware that it is purely American to acknowledge that our rights come from God and not the state, she has nevertheless done us quite a service. She has been more honest than many Christian leaders. I'm talking about those Christian leaders who, disregarding the crown rights of King Jesus, look like a disheveled band of Anglo-Saxons eager to pay the raiding Vikings the Danegeld. Yes, I know that she attempted to paint the notion that our rights come from God as fringe. For this, she is rightly ridiculed. Yes, you can find clips of Joe Biden saying our rights come from God. Yes, our nation's founding father said something about men being endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So do respond to the clip with a good hearty laugh that bubbles up from somewhere in the nether regions. But as you do, don't miss what Heidi has done for us. She has actually set the table quite nicely. The first thing that we must grasp with both hands, and I mean grasp it, hold tight, shake it around a bit, and fasten it down with a couple of lag bolts, is that the time for dancing in the middle is over. We are all Christian nationalists now. As Abraham Kuyper said many years ago, yeah, that we're all Christian nationalists now? Years ago, quote, the conflict has always been and will be until the end, Christianity or paganism, the idols or the living God. There was a time in American society when the average man could carry on with his business, reaping the benefits of a Christian society, while oblivious himself to the Christian structure behind his nation's laws, customs, and traditions. Momentum is a thing, after all. But you eventually have to stop coasting on the gains of your grandfathers and start peddling if you don't want to be eaten by Rousseau and his horde of bandits. Heidi is not simply an ill-informed MSNBC panelist. She is that, indeed. But that is not all that she is. She is a sign of the times. 
Do you really think that here in the year of our Lord, 2024, that anyone left of center would hear what she said and reply with, now, Heidi, don't you know that our nation has a long tradition of common sense people acknowledging that our rights come from the triune God? Don't you know that in 1892, the Supreme Court, in a case called Holy Trinity versus the United States, stated that we are a Christian nation? Haven't you heard that the Treaty of Paris, which ended the war for independence and officially recognized the United States as an independent nation, opened with these words, quote, in the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. And Heidi, has it escaped your attention that 50 of the 55 men present at the Constitutional Convention were Orthodox Christians? No, you can't picture that at all. For that matter, you can't picture more than about three people right of center informing Heidi of this perfectly sound history. Welcome to the new world, my friend. Here is what we are going to do about it. We will not, we must not, let the left define any more terms, not even Christian nationalism. And yes, some of the reactions from conservatives have permitted the left to do just that. I'm talking about those reactions that run along the lines of, what do you mean you have to advocate some Christian structure to our national identity, traditions, leadership, and laws in order to hold that our rights come from God? Silly Heidi, you don't have to do any of that in order to believe that our rights come from God. For Pete's sake, don't go calling me a Christian nationalist just because I stand with Thomas Jefferson. That response is the kind that is no longer permissible. Just take a look around after you say it. MSNBC and Politico are not impressed. They look upon your qualifications and still think you are worthy of the gulag. Your fellow Christians are equally nettled, wondering why you're so quickly dissenting from that 1892 Supreme Court ruling. I said before that Heidi has been more honest than most, and poor lady, her honesty has gotten her in a heap of trouble. What do I mean? Well, she said the secret thing out loud. She admitted that the rights come from God thing is indeed a Christian thing. And come to think of it, if our civil rights come from God, then maybe we owe him something. She stepped out of line. She stopped marching in the silly parade we have been marching in for too long. That parade is the one where we pay vague lip service to a vague deity about some vague rights that we get from him. Poor Heidi essentially said, but guys, if we get our rights from the Christian God, doesn't it follow that we owe him some kind of allegiance? My goodness. Did you hear that? Owe him some kind of allegiance? Mm. What does that sound like, Pastor Davis? Sounds like uh, enforcing laws, putting exactly. laws in place. Now here it comes. It's about to come in 55, in another minute. Listen to what he says. If we say our rights come from him, we may need to get our laws from him. Our Did you hear that? Yeah. We may have to get our laws from him. Mm. Our leaders from him, our customs from him. Our leaders from him, so it's no longer a free country. You have to be a Christian. See what I'm saying? You have to be a Christian. That describes a certain way. Him and where will it stop? With Heidi cracking up the party this way, her leftist friends can't do anything but agree with her, denounce that rights come from God, and haul Russell Moore off to the recalibration camps for his Christian nationalist ways. And this is not the most troubling part. The real trouble was that when the music stopped after Heidi let the cat out of the bag, many Christians have replied, oh, Heidi, don't worry, we can have the rights from God thing with very little ramifications for our nation. Really, look at how we have been carrying on since the 60s. Fret not. But Heidi is not so sure about these reassurances. She has good reason not to be. Now watch this. Consider the logic. If our civil rights come from the triune God, does it not follow that civil allegiance must be paid to him? We might stamp, in God we trust, on our money. We might declare that we are one nation under God. We might... Now here it comes now. This is where he talks about one day of rest in seven. ...structure our civil affairs such that on the one day in seven, which God has deemed holy, we rest from our work and worship him. This civil and public acknowledgement should certainly be formalized in our governing documents. Can I, can I say that? Can I play that one more time? This is what he said. Money. We might declare that we are one nation under God. We might structure our civil affairs such that on the one day in seven, which God has deemed holy, we rest from our work and worship him. This civil and public acknowledgement should certainly be formalized in our governing documents. Can I play, let me play one more time. You, you got to hear this. I want you to hear this. We might declare that we are one nation under God. We might structure our civil affairs such that on the one day in seven, which God has deemed holy, we rest from our work and worship him. This civil and public acknowledgement should certainly be formalized in our governing documents. How could we do any other if our rights come from him? But it is not going to stop there. If so, our rights so come... You, you, did you hear that? 
What does that sound like? The, that one day in seven should be in our government documents. That means it should be a law. So you see that these Christian nationalists are not playing around. Now watch this right here. Let me go back to, um, to uh, what came out last year with this guy. He comes, he says a little bit more forceful. Listen to this. Life. And so civil law ought to order us to the things of eternal life, word and sacrament. Civil law cannot compel belief in the gospel, nor the one worships God in heart, but it can create the best outward conditions for one to conduct undisturbed and focused worship of God. Thus, in addition to ensuring justice in our civil relations, civil authority can regulate the Sabbath day, for example, to remove those daily cares and concerns that distract us from Sunday worship. Ensuring justice in our civil relations, civil authority can regulate the Sabbath day, for example, to remove those daily cares and concerns that distract us from Sunday worship. Now, if they regulate it, that means they can control, right? So that means they can enforce. They can pass and enforce law, right? right? So what happens is when this man's talking about this right here, this does not sound good. This sounds more like a Sunday law agitation. Yep. Yes, Chad. It's amazing how much they're pushing for this fixing of the laws than denying the actual Article 6 when it says that there shall be no religious test required for anyone to hold an office or a position in our government. That was clearly stated that there's fact that right. we are to never do that. Right. Listen to this. Come from God, then won't it follow that our laws must come from him? It would be quite strange if our rights came from God, but then the law of our land paid no regard to what he has revealed. I dare say that the God-given rights might collide with the laws of our land if those laws went rogue and didn't pay attention to the rights giver. Moreover, if our rights come from the triune God, then does that not mean that we would need leaders from him as well? What good from him as well so that means that if you don't believe in God remember the Constitution said no religious test shall be made right right and so they just really going against the Constitution this is what the, leads to the image of the beast will it do if our rights are from God but our leaders are not won't they disregard the rights that are freely given us by God? Right about now is when some mid-management evangelical leader comes along and puts his hand around a young Johnny who is reading this post. This young man is thinking that the logic thus far holds, but his boss at the seminary says something like, listen here, this is sounding a bit too theocratic, dogmatic, and nationalistic. Stringing together a few more scary words, he adds, our rights come from God indeed, but our laws come straight out of the old noggin here. Our leaders come from the voting booth. That's just how it goes. Fret not. If these leaders get out of line, we will take care of them in the next election. When we do, we will get some sane men, some competent Turks, as they say, back into the halls of power who will restore sanity, repeal the bad laws, and get some better ones on the books. That is, that's at least how things used to go. But thanks to COVID, both young Johnny and his superior have spent a good deal of time thinking through Romans 13. All of the questions are not answered yet, but there is a clear consensus. What does Romans 13 say? That we're to obey the laws of the government. The spirit of prophecy says in several places that when the Sunday law crisis comes, they will present Romans 13. Right. Am I right? That's right. Right. Forming around this much. One, civil authorities are ministers of the triune God, Romans 13, verse 6. Two, they have been appointed by God for, quote, there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, Romans 13, verse 1. Three, they must not be a terror to good works but to evil, Romans 13, verse 3. The implications are not difficult to trace. In the name of some vague civic theism, do we really want to argue that unbaptized men who care not for God's revelation are fit to be his ministers? Do we really want to claim that a man can serve as a servant of God, establish laws that he approves of, and execute his wrath while publicly and plainly paying him no reverence? You know grandma's not going to abide that nonsense. Don't make her wash your mouth out with soap. Since we are all Christian nationalists now, we should build upon our Romans 13 observations. Moving forward, be it resolved that we take a closer look at what God means when he says to his covenant people, kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 23. For now, three teams present themselves to you, and the only option for faithful Christians is team C. 
You can wrestle around with your brothers in Team C, but Team B never was a faithful option, and thanks be to God that it is crumbling to pieces. Team A, the atheists. We reject both that our rights come from God as well as the notion that our civil order, traditions, laws, leaders, etc., should be ordered from, through, and to Christianity and the Christian God. Team B, the blighters. We believe our rights come from God, but reject the notion that our civil order, traditions, laws, leaders, etc., should be ordered from, through, and to Christianity and the Christian God. Team C, the Christian nationalists. We believe our rights come from God and also the notion that our civil order, traditions, laws, leaders, etc., should be ordered from, through, and to Christianity and the Christian God. Once we establish that our civil laws must be ordered from Christianity and the Christian God, it follows that we must decide how he orders them. What do you think about that? This, uh, my mind is going to the image of the beast. Exactly. A union of church, church and, and state. state. That's, what he's, that's what he's talking that's about. That's what he's really talking about. And Christianity is the law of the land. Therefore, brothers and sisters, those who choose not to serve, whether they may be religious, other religious persuasions, or just may be atheists, that's called, that's called where people do not have what's called liberty of conscience anymore. Let me finish this up. In a longer version of the clip, Heidi went on to reference natural law, which signals the need for Christian civil reformers to hammer out the role between natural law and biblical law in human law. Thomas Aquinas, an old school Christian nationalist himself, Thomas Aquinas was a Catholic, right? Thomas Aquinas was Roman Catholic. Wasn't he a Roman Catholic? Yeah. He was a Roman Catholic, so he's quote, he's saying Thomas Aquinas, this is years ago. Now listen. He puts, he, he summarizes this, listen to this. Grounds human law in divine law. In one of my favorite- Grounds human law in divine law. Favorite lines from the Summa, he writes, quote, Now both these conditions are verified of human law, since it is both something ordained to an end and is a rule or measure ruled or measured by a higher measure. And this higher measure is twofold, the divine law and the natural law. It follows that if you are going to install legislators and judges in your nation, they must establish human law and rule according to the higher measure, which includes both natural and biblical law. You hear that? Should such men be educated in the higher measure? Of course they should be. Now someone is going to ask, are you really saying that civil authorities must study the Bible in order to be fit for their office? Did you hear that? Should civil legislators study the Bible to be fit for office? Here it comes. Now someone is going to ask, are you really saying that civil authorities must study the Bible in order to be fit for their office? Well, I didn't say it. Aquinas did. Listen to the angelic doctor. You will serve God or Baal. You will have Christian nationalism or Moloch nationalism. You hear that? Uh, they're not. What you want to say about that? They're not playing. They're, they're trying to set up the image of the beast. They're trying to set up the that image. Is line with that project twenty. That's right. That's exactly with the project twenty twenty five. And so what happens is, remember last week we talked about Earth Sabbath. Remember that last week. Guess what? They want. They have another day. They have. Last week it was April the seventh. Now they say we want to do it on July twentieth as well we are adding a second day for an earth sabbath march today is march the 8th 2024 and we haven't seen too many marches organized for the april 7th 2024 date however we have seen an increase of visitors due to our website on the last week thanks to people like myself we are hoping this will continue creating awareness for the earth sabbath march on july 20th let me, let, let me hear you. Look at it. Weekly plan and look at this video. It, where's the video? Is it right here? Oh, hold on. No, because they had, they had, here it is right here. It is a global initiative that encourages people worldwide to give the planet a rest one day a week to reduce energy consumption and protect the environment. By observing a weekly Earth Sabbath, we can significantly reduce carbon emissions, conserve natural resources, and promote sustainable practices. This movement is inclusive and open to people from diverse backgrounds and cultures, 
allowing them to participate in Earth Sabbath activities based on their personal beliefs and interests. Together, we can create a global impact by encouraging worldwide participation in... Wow, encouraging worldwide participation. Unite for change. Mm. Do you see that? Global participation. Do you think we should unite with this? Nope. No, because we already keep the true Sabbath, so... But you see that? In this cause. On July 20th, 2024, a global Earth Sabbath march is planned to raise awareness and demand action towards a... <laughs> it's like, regardless of whatever angle you look at it, from the right, you got Christian nationalism. Right. Then on the left, you have this climate change. Movement, right. But they're all coming together on Sunday. It's just like... That's Herod the bottom Island. line. They're coming together on that one issue, and that was, to, you know, with Christ. I see you, Chad. Hold on one second. Establishing a weekly Earth Sabbath day. Visit us at wow. WW4. A global Earth Sabbath march is planned to raise awareness and demand action towards establishing a weekly Earth Sabbath day. Visit us at www.earthsabbath.world. We urge you to organize or participate in local Earth Sabbath marches in your communities, schools, or workplaces to amplify this message. Collective action and individual responsibility are crucial in protecting the planet for future generations. By joining the Earth Sabbath movement and committing to observe a weekly Earth Sabbath day, you can contribute to environmental conservation and make a significant impact. Together, we can create a sustainable future for our planet through the Earth Sabbath movement. Join us in this global initiative and be a part of the change we want to see in the world. It's over. Visit us at www.earthsabbath.world. Notice, like, right at the bottom, those words they had, like, I saw one where it says, Take it off the screen, Richard. Action. Demand uh -huh. action. That's what bottom. I was going to yeah. And then they had on there, uh, for our children. So if we're not joining with this movement, That's right. they're going to look at, upon us as the enemy. Like, yes. look, you're, you're, you're being selfish. You're not thinking about the children. You're not loving your neighbor. Right. Didn't we hear that before? A COVID. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm, you, mm. If you don't get, it's over, you don't though. love your neighbor. You're not yeah. thinking about your neighbor. It's the same, the same, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Do you see this, brothers and sisters? They're just, they're just building. Uh, they, what do you say, Larry? Well, he could. Well, you said, Go ahead. You the said microphone. It, um, you microphone. said it, Pastor. You know, I was going to say the, the key words demand, but there was no other demand. Said, inclusive movement. How is it inclusive when everybody may not believe the same way? Exactly. It actually isolates people and it's like, oh, you don't believe that? So it isn't inclusive. Right. So it's just. It's over, y'all. Yeah, it's, it's over. It's over. And look what's going on. Let's go back to the screen. Brothers and sisters, look at this right here. Dear Sunday Skin Care, Sundays are the day to reset. And Yahoo News features Dear Sunday Skin Care to help you look good on this day. Owner of Dear Sunday Skin Care, a black-owned business with a luxury product line, has retail space to help other business owners. You know, it's okay to have your own business, but listen to what she says. She says that Sunday are my reset days. I always look forward to my Sunday routine. It was my self-care Sunday, but why can't every day be a self-care day? Staples told the outlet. Brothers and sisters, whenever you put Sunday in anything, I get scared, don't you? Because this stuff is prophetic. Do you understand this? You know, that poor girl, she don't know what she's doing. But listen to this right here. Nigerian Catholic priests asserts that nations can dispense with their legislative bodies and simply th enforce the Catholic Church's interpretation of the Ten Commandments. Is it over, y'all? Look at that. Look at that. They're carrying that. That's paganism, brothers and sisters. A Nigerian Catholic priest where he says the third commandment says, remember the what day? The Sabbath day. So brothers and sisters, here we see a Catholic agent advocating for a system of government where religious doctrine is considered supreme. Do you see that right there? It also implies that religious leaders should have the primary influence over political what? Decisions. Wow. This is dangerous. So listen to this. The Ten Commandments is our guiding principle. It is the law that controls every other law. It is the constitution of all constitutions. If people were to embrace the Ten Commandments as their what, somebody? You see that, Sister Daphne? So we would not need to spend all the money they're spending on lawmakers. 
the Ten Commandments covers all. So in other words, if instead of having a constitution, we just make the Ten Commandments the constitution of every country or the world, mm. when it comes to the Sabbath, it would be illegal for people to rest and work on another day other than Sunday. Do you see what's going on, brothers and sisters? Do you see what's going on? Do you see why we got to tell people? They talking about this Earth Sabbath thing, and guess what? I'm not even done. Guess what, brothers and sisters? Look what the Catholic said, National Catholic Register. God wants everyone to be Catholic so that they can receive him in the Eucharist. <laughs> should, should we evangelize our Protestant friends? A blue collar answer to Protestantism. Catholic questions Protestants can't answer. Brothers and sisters, this man said, in essence, I, I got to come, come, back, come back with this next week. God wants everybody to be Catholic. Wow. Is it over, y'all? It's over. But hold on. Didn't Sister Wyatt say before Jesus comes, every uncouth thing will be demonstrated? Here it is. I don't know where that. And that's not. It's not shallow church in Chicago. Shallow in some other church. Uh, seven Didn't Ellen White say it doesn't matter whether it's in the black church, it doesn't matter whether it's in the white church or it's in the Spanish church. She said we will see this going on in the church just before the close of probation. Look at this right here. I mean, this thing is terrible, y'all. I can't even show you the rest of this, and it's just. Thank God we don't do this at state line. But, uh, but I got something worse than that. Are you ready for this next one? Somebody said, what do I have? Ah, uh, well, this thing about Gunu, he came down last week. Um, where is it at? And you know what? Somebody sent this to me. And oh yeah, no, it's not, because they were doing the Michael Jackson stuff. But somebody sent me something on the internet and I thought I had it here. Uh, man, where is it at? Uh, it wasn't the thing on Gnome Diop. All right. You know, people just going to believe whatever they want to believe. All right, take it off the screen for a second, Brother Richard. Take it off the screen for a second, Brother Richard. All right. So we see about this Earth Sabbath thing. Is that something that we need to be concerned about? Now I gotta find this right here. I gotta find this video. What you wanna say while while you're doing this, uh, while I'm looking for it, what do you wanna say about all this, my brother? Um, basically, the signs that we see here taking we place in the world, uh, religiously, politically, and even in the church, these things show that Jesus is soon to come. That time is indeed running out. That's right. Um, as we see uh, the push for a union of church and state. Uh, we see Satan is working hard to put our people to sleep. Uh, he's working hard to keep our people caught up in worldliness and, and the things of this, this life so that they're not focusing on that which is true, that which is enduring, which is found in the word of God. That's right. And brothers and sisters, I want to show you. You can, take, you can put it on the screen. While probation doors is closed, you can put it on the screen, Brother Richard. What happens is you have Adventist church. I'm, just, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I want you to see this for yourself. Well, this is in a church, right? But what's wrong with the music? But, but watch, keep on watching. It's over. I'm not even going to show you the rest of the video. Brothers and sisters, when, when you have seven day, this is in India, when you have seven day Adventist institutions allowing stuff like this to happen, just know that if they don't stop doing it, God is going to have to close these schools down. If they're not going to stop this, if they, you know, we need the third angel's message, brothers and sisters. Mm. We don't need all this fluff and foolishness. Do you understand this right here? We don't need it. Mm. 
And I don't even want to talk about it, but I had to share with this with you. But everything's not bad. I found this yesterday in the Southern Tidings. The Georgia Cumberland Conference, we want to give a shout out to Georgia Cumberland Conference, but they have voted to pass out the great controversy and participate with the general conference. It was shared across the conference, and guess what? Lives have been changed. Amen. 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 And when we say the great controversy, we're talking about all 678 pages, all 42 chapters. Amen. And they were passing it out. It says the Georgia Cumberland Conference actively shared participating in the General Conference Great Controversy Project in 2023. It says here, since then, hundreds of thousands of copies of Ellen White's book have been distributed to individuals in Georgia and what, somebody? Tennessee. A total of how many churches? And eight schools within the conference participated and ordered a collective 200,000 English and 100,000 Spanish copies of the book. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, when our church is doing something right, we need to give them their kudos. Amen. The conference also included custom pages in the newly printed books that include, Q that include QR codes guiding readers to listen to the audio version of the book and sign up for Bible studies with people continuing to request Bible studies. Isn't that a good thing? Amen. People have done it with their community outreaches. And listen to this. I want you to read this right here. Many churches have already been blessed to see the impact the book has made on those who received the copy. Estepan Lopez, personal ministries director at the Ultawa Tennessee Hispanic Church, received the follow-up visit by someone he gave a book to offer to, to, to after a group from his church was handing him out in Chattanooga. I gave a copy of the book, The Great Controversy, to the pastor of another church, said Lopez. After a week, he stopped by my office and told me that he is using it on Sundays as his church as a textbook. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise let the name of the Lord for that elder to give it to somebody. Amen. 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 And Gary Rustad, the conference president, describes the importance of this initiative by referencing Ellen White's own words. The great controversy should be widely what? It contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. In its outline of the closing scenes of Earth's history, it bears a powerful testimony in behalf of the truth. I am more anxious to see a wide circulation for this book than for any others that I have written. For in the great controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in my other works. Praise God for a conference getting out the great controversy. Take it off the screen right quick, Brother Richard. Brother Chad, what do you want to say? I want to say that Satan is very cunning because the, the form mentioned before, the new uh, Sabbath rest day, uh, July 20th is actually Saturday. And we need to bring back our history to let mm -hmm. people know the history, though. When the Blair Bill was introduced and there was A.T. Jones at the argument, Senator Blair asked, so you would be against if even if we made Saturday right. the movement? And the answer for Seventh-day Adventists should be always unanimously, yes. yes, we would be against it. We are not to compel the conscience. It exactly. is an individual choice. Individual choice. That's right. So <laughs> this is serious. Now, I'm going to read to you. Did you praise God for that, um, the, that book distribution, that conference? Let's go to the screen one last time. Now, I'm going to read you a letter that a seven-day Adventist pastor sent to me talking about you shouldn't be putting out them billboards. I'm going to, I'm going to read it to you. Want me to read it to you? Want me, want me to read it to you? Well, before we do that, we want to let you know in two weeks, for those of you in the Chatt Chattanooga, Tennessee area, Southern Adventist University um, area, I'll be um, at 6 o'clock on the 23rd. My wife and I will be down there to do a special Sunday Law update with my dear brother, Brother James Bowen. Brother Bowen, boy, he is, they have passed out thousands of invitations. They done gave it to the conference president. They done gave it to everybody. They gave it to the, to the president of the university to, just to come out. Yeah, so we're expecting a packed house. And brothers and sisters, this is our newest billboard up in Cookville, Tennessee. And look at them people taking pictures of it. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And I'm pretty assuming these are seven-day events taking this. Brothers and sisters, we want to thank God. We got it up in Richmond, Virginia, Vancouver, Washington area. Praise the name of the Lord. And we got a picture of 
the guy who told me, can you please put it up in Vancouver? Amen. Brothers and sisters, we thank God. Um, we got it back up in Poplar Bluff. We got it up for another month. Hallelujah. Amen. We want to let you know that AI can be used for evil, but somebody did this billboard for me by AI. Hallelujah. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Sunday worship will be the mark of the beast. We're getting ready to put this out pretty soon. And we're going to put this one out. It's Sunday, the Lord's Day, or the mark of the beast. And, of course, the one that you all love. Amen. But guess what? We got it for my dear sister, and we got it for my dear brother. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we thank God we're getting it out. You know, Pete, this, I'm going to read to you this letter this guy sent me that, you know, you shouldn't put them billboards out. But look, while Adventists are telling me not to do it, you got the Thursday people are putting those billboards up. And the pet Catholic Church is putting that billboard up, right? right? And the atheist is putting their billboards up. And all we act, so what's wrong with putting this up? All, all we're doing is asking a question. And people, you got seven day Adventists telling, trying to tell me that you shouldn't do that. Well, guess what? We're not going to listen to that. Brothers and sisters, we're going to leave this up. I want to let you know. Can I, read, can I read to you this letter? Can I read it to you? While you're looking at that, and if you're able to help us, please help us. Because, brothers and sisters, we're getting ready to uh, put some more out. And I was uh, minding my business, you know, thinking about my daddy. And then somebody wrote me. And guess what he said? He said, hey, brother. I'm reading you the letter now. Hey, brother. I hope you're blessed and doing well. I have a quick question for you. Do you have any statistics of new folks that have been converted to our faith through your billboards? People keep asking me. People, but people keep asking me, like, unless they see some numbers, then maybe something's wrong with it, right? I said, I don't. Only God knows. The gay people put their billboards up, right? Are they counting how many people got converted to homosexuality because of that? It's always putting that message out there that it's okay, right? I said, he said, hmm, I assure you've had people question your methods before the effectiveness of this witnessing strategy. He says, who, who he works with, okay, he's a seven-day Adventist minister who teaches Bible doctrine, he's an evangelist, personal evangelism and public evangelism, not trying to be argumentative at all, but when I saw your billboard, I have to admit it didn't come across very winsome to me. So I wanted to go, you know, Matthew 18 on me. Would you pray about considering changing the billboard? You think we should change this? Which the the, the, the oh the oh which one was he talking about? He was talking about this billboard right here. This one right here. That was the one. Brothers and sisters, okay, let's 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 examine that. Okay. Let's let's look at this. Let's do some let's do some uh brainstorming, okay. Am I bashing anybody? Question. All I'm doing is asking a question. How, when did ask, asking a question become bashing? It's not. It's just a question. <laughs> did you know that the mark of the beast will be worship on Sunday? Why would, I, why would we put that up there? And you get a free book. You get a free book. <laughs> just go to the website. You can. Mm -hmm. They believe that you shouldn't be doing this stuff. Okay, this is what the guy told me, all right? So, and so, if you believe I should do it, then please help us out. Listen to what he says. Would you pray about considering changing the website and offer more of an approach that doesn't come across, for lack of a better word, crazy sounding? How is telling somebody that the mark of the beast is Sunday? Hold on, hold on. How is telling somebody that the mark of the beast is Sunday worship crazy? He says, I mean, there is a reason we don't open an evangelistic campaign one night with the subject of the mark of the beast. There is a proper channel of information that must be revealed before people will see and understand this message. What is your thought on this? You know what I did? I gave him what Spirit of Prophecy says, that every advertising agency be employed. And then I showed him a couple of billboards. I said, look at this billboard. Mm -hmm. This one says, say gay, LGBT. I said, this is crazy. I said, well, the billboards promoting this lifestyle, it's imperative. We plant truth in the minds of the people. And I said, I will not be changing the billboards. He said, first of all, let me address your comments. Then he said he disagrees with my point with Ellen White. 
you know, that I took it out of context. He says, I believe we should use every method that we can reach souls for Jesus, including the press. However, this quote is in no way relevant to what I messaged you about. My message is regarding the tactfulness in which we share the truth. I personally do not believe the billboards tactfully sharing the message of the truth in a winsome way. Brothers and sisters, when did asking a question about the mark of the beast become offensive? Hold on one second. Hold on one second. Let me finish this right here. Nobody that knows anything about successful soul when it begins with a conversation, did you know that the mark of the beast will be worshipped on Sunday? Brothers, if I was doing a crusade, I wouldn't start off with the mark of the beast. You know that. Right. All we're doing is putting up a billboard no different than me giving you a great controversy. Mm -hmm. The person that, that might be passing down the road um, it might be just that thing they need to say. They may be the thing they need to and say. Of course, that, that billboard is not going, it's not going to, uh, everybody not going to accept the right thing right. there. You know, uh, that person who might not have received that, they might get a, a flyer for an evangelistic meeting. Yes. They'll come to that, and they come in through that. Uh, another person, all it takes is just them seeing that billboard. The Holy Spirit mm -hmm. already been working on that mind. See. They see that billboard, boom, man, I'm going to check this out. And they get that free book, and they, you know. So we got to use all the means that we exactly. can. Exactly. Look at this for a second. Whenever a person goes on the, and says, what day is the seventh day of the week? Guess what, the, guess what that billboard says? Sunday. And, they, and then if they said it, it must be true, right? And look how much of the world, the majority of the world believes it says. Do you understand this? Can I finish reading? I, I see Brother Richard. I, I see the hands. To the average Joe, I see the hands who has no competent knowledge of the history of the change of the Sabbath, which most folks, this sounds bizarre and fanatical. Wow. Wow. Regarding your statement about the general conference passing out the GCs, guess what he said? Awesome book. The book reveals truth gradually instead of slapping them in the face with a question that's formed as a statement of fact that comes across very offensive to people who don't have a competent knowledge of history. But you know what? I'm going to read the rest of this letter next time. I'm going I'm I'm to read this point by point. Because I told him that that book is big. A lot of people don't like to read. You know that, right? Oh, man. Let, let me just read the chapter that interests me the most. That's what I would do. Am I right? So they may see something. They may, the very first chapter, they see Pope and Catholic. Oh, my father's a Catholic. Oh, I'm a Catholic. Or my friend's a Catholic. Oh, I thought the Pope was a really religious man. People are going to know when they read that book. You just read two, two, two paragraphs. You know, whoever wrote this book, they don't think the Pope's a really good person. And that Sunday worship is not the day to worship. You don't have to get far. And brothers and sisters, and this is what's being promulgated while the whole world is getting ready to wonder after the beast. Do you understand this? What happens if somebody opens the great controversy and reads this right here? The Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. What are people, what are you going to say when people see this? And then what about all the videos on the, what about all the people, the first video they ever saw by a seven-day Adventist was somebody talking about the papacy and Sunday worship. You can take it off the screen, but, but Brother Richard, what you want to say, man? What you okay, want to say? Let me just say this, Pastor. Okay. The National Sunday Law book. Yeah. I had 30 of them this, just this past week. Only got three left. Or was it yesterday? Yeah. No, day before yesterday. Uh, I drove a lady to... Her job off a of university. She went to Mount Calvary Seventh Day Adventist Church just to visit. When I gave her a book, she said, This is the answer to my prayer. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm just going to say this for you. You're going to have a lot of people going against what you're doing. But what I'm going to tell you is to stand, continue to do what God wants you to do, because if they're not, they're not in the mindset of telling others about God's right. coming. So That's therefore, right. 
they are of the enemy. Oh, we know that. Don't, don't let nobody change your mind because if the Holy Spirit is putting it on your heart, that is what you're supposed to do. That's right. Amen. So do not go against what you're led to do. That's right. You can take it off the screen. And for those of you that are watching online, if you want to send a donation to Project Ladder Rain, you see the websites, you see the Zelle, you see the Cash App, we would greatly appreciate it. We're getting ready to put out 10 billboards this month on this subject. So brothers and sisters, it's going to cost some money. So if the Holy Spirit is put upon your heart, remember Project Ladder Rain, you're giving. Yes, Sister, um, sister uh, Pride, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll be interested to find out what is he doing to reach souls. Now, this person's an evangelist, and they're doing a good work, but what happens is this right here. You know, the average Joe don't do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. average, the average Adventist pastor doesn't mm -hmm. do put out billboards like this. Mm -hmm. you, you know that, right? I mean, yeah. even, even our conference president, Brian Denise, told me he got a call from two presidents mm -hmm. complaining about our billboards. Oh. And thank God our president didn't tell me to take it down and all that kind of stuff, you know, and that was it. And so, but what happens is this right here. We're living in the day where somebody's going to have to, we're going to have to kind of put it in people's face. Do you understand this right here? Because, like, you was a former rapper, right? I mean, you used to involved in rap, right? Yeah, somewhat. Yeah, somewhat. Okay. You wasn't big in it, but, you know, you know, the songs that we, anybody who was into hip-hop, we like them songs that were just in your face kind of stuff, right? Those were the ones that made the most money. But when we're in our face with the, tr in people's face with the truth, then brothers and sisters, we want to water it down. What do you want to say about that, brother? Uh, you know, like what Brother Richard said, we, we, you know, just to sum up what he was saying, we don't know how the Holy Spirit is going to work. Um, what may not work for one person will work for the other person. Exactly. And so we can't just put everything in a one size fix all right. type of box you know every situation is different and so that's why we're told from the pen of inspiration we're to use all the means we can different exactly. avenues we can exactly. to get the, the truth that's out it. just like georgia cumberland they use the, you know the great controversy, great con great controversy. Oh, what about that, that. And, yeah. yeah what about that yeah so even yeah. great controversy you get what to the third chapter whatnot it's already going it's already it's going uh, it's going in going right in, talking about the roman catholic uh, papal papacy. system how the papacy came about yeah, exactly so you don't even have to get far in the book you have to go far in the so book. if we're going to say that about the billboards then what about great controversy what about great controversy because i you know what i told the person because somebody told me i talked to a person um in the nad and i asked him about you know i didn't get into about the billboards but the great you know what he told me he said, we're going to get the great controversy up. But before we do that, we're going to give people desire of ages first and take them through that book first, then give them great controversy. First of all, the great, con uh, how many books? Okay, desire of ages is 835 pages. The average Joe ain't reading 835 pages. You know that. People just don't read like they used to. Do you understand this right here? So what happens is this right here. Desire of ages is a great book, but she said to get the great controversy out. Obviously, God knows what he's doing. See, what it is, we have people, lay people and leaders alike, who really don't think that we need to give this message out the way we say it. You know where we first, you know that billboard down the road where we first put our first, where I put, put our first billboard? If you drive by it now, you know what's on there now? It is on both sides a billboard for a strip joint in Huntsville. Wow. I'm not even going to mention the name. You go see it. It's, they, they, yeah. And the guy who let me put the build up board up for like another two years, for two years, it was a Roman Catholic that let me do it. Wow. It's, oh, nobody, do you, how come the Adventists ain't crying about that? Okay? Brothers and sisters, we're going to have to be a little unconventional, do you understand this, in order to save one person. People keep asking me, well, what about the results? I don't know what the results are. Find out in heaven. We gonna find when we get to heaven. Somebody gonna say that, oh, you the one that put that bill. I, I know at least somebody gonna get saved from it. Am I right? Am I right? Somebody came to my house forty years ago and sold a book to my mother. I didn't read the book till five years later, and then I come into the church. So what happens is God is putting. God wants us to put sold. Sometimes we gotta sow some what? Seeds. Yes. What you want to say? Uh, before, before. It's over, Brother Chatter here. Yeah. 
if you remember years ago that people used to go around and say, we don't want to agitate them because they will come after us. Right. And that is the same thing that when, when, when that evangelist send you that letter, that's the same thing comes in mind. It's like, oh, we don't want to agitate them so they could come after us. Right. Now, I'm not, trust me, if I'm doing an evangelist meeting, I'm not going to talk about the mark of the beast the first day. Okay, we got to lead people along. Do you understand this? If I'm knocking on people's door to give Bible studies, I'm not going to do that first. I'm going to make, you know, let them know that we believe in Jesus, lead them along. Then we give them those precious truths. But when it comes to passing out tracts, passing out books, and putting billboards up, brothers and sisters, that's a whole different approach. Do you understand this? And let me tell you this right here. Do you believe that the General Conference has enough money? Do you believe the North American Division has enough money to put these billboards out in every town? Yes. I had somebody ask me, you should talk to every conference and get them to support the billboard campaign. Do you think that's a good idea? You know what? No, it's not. It will go through 35 committees before they give me an answer. You know that. You know what I'm talking about. We don't need to go. We just need to just do it. I just chose to do it. You can do it. Anybody who's watching me, people call me all the time. Can you put a billboard up in my city? And I do it. People give me the money. I remember one guy gave me $6,000 to put a billboard up in L.A. We put it up on I-10 going east and west, right by Loma Linda. Somebody's hearing the truth, brothers and sisters. And I wish we had. How many billboards do you think we need to get up? At least 10 billion of them. Am I right? I don't need a mic. You can say it. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could be, calculate or be able to find out if people are accessing it. You know what I mean, like the guy asked? Yeah. Um, okay. can, can I tell you? At least 12,000 people have gone to the website because of the billboard. 12,000. That's a lot of people. Because I, cause I, I, got, I got the stats to prove it. But how many people downloaded it, I don't know yet. But I can go and ask them. Yeah. So people have people been seeing it. People have been seeing it. Yes. It's a lot of people. So just know, let God, let God, let's let God be God. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. Well, and the the other thing with the the offense is, is if someone if Satan is going to drive an offense on anybody, it can be it will be offensive no matter what we do. It no is true we do. have to be very careful on right. what we what we right. do, but there is a difference as you as you were saying, Pastor. We're offering a book which then gives a person to explore a longer understanding of what's going on when you're doing a a. Uh, evangelist series, you only have a certain amount of time before a person gets tired of it. Exactly. And so, yes, you don't sit there and, and bludgeon someone. We to don't death, bludgeon nobody. But with a book or something of the tracks, they can set it down and they're like, you know, something's bothering me about that. And they go back to the book exactly. and they pick it up. And the Lord allows that slow working of the heart to exactly. really do it. Whereas the, the, the other way is that's it. And they might Ah, I'm not going to go. And they missed the entire series. Now they have no way to go and fill in that part exactly. that they missed. Exactly. And the last thing is, I'm never going to forget, silent preachers. Ellen White says we must get these things out like the leaves of autumn. People, you don't know where and who's going to see. There's going to be somebody that's going to That's the first time I've ever seen a strip joint billboard out this way. I've never, in all the years, I, there's only one in Huntsville, but a stick got a strip joint built, and guess what? Somebody's going to look at that and say, I'm going to go. Am I right? It's, somebody's going to do that. Hope, you know, it's what it is, and understand this. One day, it's going to be, the crisis is going to be upon us, and I'm just going to be real, Pastor Davis. You know when the when it's really going to hit the fan is when they say, and watch. Remember when during the pandemic you couldn't say anything against Dr. Fauci? Yeah. You couldn't say anything against the, you know what? If they're going to say, you can't say nothing against the Pope. Mm. They're saying no. Do you know that certain social media websites, social media pages, will not allow any advertising that goes against the Pope? to be put on social media already. And not only that, any in, on Facebook, they said they will not allow any advertisement about the Jewish Sabbath controversy. What they're really saying is anything against Sunday worship. Mm. 
So brothers and sisters, understand that Satan is behind all this. And I'm not here to justify the right, to justify why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because God told me to do it. Amen. And thank God, thank God, every time I look at Joanna, a Roman Catholic, ex-Roman Catholic, she got the flyers three years in a row. I'm like, where were you at those three years? And do you know during those three years, we didn't baptize nobody. And then that year, 2019, she came with Bill. I'm like, okay, they coming. They kept second night, third night. Okay, that's good. They coming, but they, I'm pretty sure they're going to leave, right? Devil speaking to me. Four nights. I said, when I get to the Sabbath, Mark of the Beast, I know they ain't coming back. They kept coming and coming and coming. And you know what's so deep? The only reason why she didn't come the, those three years, because she didn't have a friend to bring her. And Bill said, I will come. She comes. She gets baptized. Unfortunately, Bill passes away. And she is still here with us. You know, every time I look at this lady right here, I thank God. Can you come up here? Can you let everybody come? On, come, come. Let's come, come. Hey, man, we love, we love, we love Joanna, man. And she is faithful. Hallelujah. Ex-Roman Catholic. Hey, man. Hallelujah. Say, say hi to the State Line family online. Hey, man. Praise the Lord. You may sit down. We praise God for her, man. We praise God for her. And she has been faithful. And you know what we did? We put out some flyers with some beasts on it. Mm. Some beasts, the beasts of the revelation, and she came out. Was it worth it? Yeah. Was it worth it? Yeah. And you got to understand, this is called Ardmore, Alabama, but Ardmore has been hard more. <laughs> you got to understand, for three, four years, we didn't baptize nobody. We did the crusades, people come, and they just fall through the cracks. But she came in. Oh, I'll tell you. Now I know how Noah felt when he preached for 120 years. <laughs> Amen, brother. Anything you want to say, brother? Yeah. Uh, we just got to do all we can to get this message out. We just got to do all we um, can. As we see uh, religious liberty uh, being stripped from us, as we see the image of the beast yes. uh, coming together, all these different things we should be even more aggressive in getting this, this message out that God has given us. And this message that we have is in no way ecumenical. This is a message that calls us to, to separate. We either on God's side or the side of the enemy. We Inside receive, the enemy. we're either gonna receive the seal of God or the, or the mark, mark of the, of the beast. beast. Some and of y'all caught it, some of y'all didn't. All right, so, and understand what we preach here at State Line is what Christ wants us to preach. This is the message of Jesus. It's not the message of State Line. It's not the message of Ellen G. White. And this is not the message of the Seventh day Adventist Church. This is the message of Jesus that God has entrusted to us. And let's give it to the world so somebody can have a chance. Amen. All right. Well, brothers and sisters, we have come to another end. And this is the part I hate the most. I could do this for three more hours and really just take my time. And some of y'all will stay the whole time. But you know what? We must go. We have board meeting tomorrow, my brother, so we got to get ready. Amen. We got to get some sleep. Amen. Because we're going to lose one hour tonight, right? But we're going to come back. And next week, brothers and sisters, we're going to come back. And next week, we're going to give you the what, somebody? Street testimony. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's kneel for prayer, and we're going to let you go. Father in heaven, I pray that you would bless each and every single person. Bless our dear sister Joy, and may she be faithful unto death, Lord God. And may we all be faithful unto death, Lord. Father, can you bring a hundred more people in this church like Joanne, Lord, who would just accept the message and just come in, Lord, and work with the church? We're not trying to lift her up, but we thank God. It's so hard, Lord God. But Lord, this is your work. Thank you for blessing us to come tonight, and may this Sunday Law update go viral. May it reach somebody who needs to be reached and may somebody be saved from it. And we pray that you bring us back out next Sabbath in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week for another Sunday Law Update.